Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Fabio for the kind invitation to uh, come here and to meet you. It's my first day as a very young, uh, <laughs> uh, retired uh, professor, beginning his uh, third career. Yes, the title of today's lecture is Improving the Safety of Bridges, Adding Values to Bridges by Monitoring and UHPFRC. So two main topics, monitoring and UHPFRC, this ultra high performance fiber enforced cementitious composite. It's quite a long word, but I will explain it to you very quickly. And uh, both techniques, both technologies uh, add value, improve the safety. Okay, but before we go um, into this domain, of course, the climate is changing. I think everybody is now accepting this. Um, it will happen, and we need to soften the, the effect. And who will do it? Civil engineers, nobody else. The others are only talking. We have to, to take measures in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in a radical way now. This means, for example, that we have to rehabilitate, adapt, modify, existing bridges, existing structures, uh, everything that is built. We have to accept this as being given. We cannot just demolish everything and build new. This would be extremely invasive and bad for the environment. That's one of the messages I would like to state here. And uh, yes, on the right hand side, two typical bridges in Switzerland. This could also be in Italy. Typical structures from the 1960s. 70s. Are these structures for you uh, young or old? <laughs> Thank you. I'm born in 1958. So I'm extremely old for you then. <laughs> but I feel uh, very young still. No, <clears throat> but I want to, I, I will provoke you. To make you think what I want to say, there is no age. You should never use old or young to a structure because these are not living uh, creatures. These are these are objects, useful objects, nothing else. And the only thing that counts is the good condition. And in case it's a bad condition, then it's our task to improve the condition. And we have really to avoid this demolition replacement approach. I now call it also the end of life approach. Many engineers in my country, it's horrible to see all these engineers think after 80 years, we have to demolish uh, structures. Come on, that's, that's nonsense. So um, important message, sustainability is a matter of mindset. These two uh, priorities, you have to have that in your head. And when you have to, when you have a, a project and you work on an existing structure, it's just not possible to demolish it. Of course, there are some, let's say, very exceptional cases where you have to do that. Maybe because you don't no longer uh, drive cars and so on, then you can remove the bridge, okay. But the existing, we have to do uh, things with the existing. Okay, let's go quickly to England. This is the uh, very first steel bridge or considered being the first steel bridge. I had the chance to visit this structure. I took at least three hours to look at it. It's fantastic. And uh, it's fantastic as, a, as an artwork, engineering work, and also in terms of uh, sustainability, life cycle and so on. It's in service for 244 years, still for the same loads that it was designed for, pedestrian loads and, and uh, small cars, it's in excellent condition. It was re restored recently. There's no end of life, life in view. And never we will kill such a structure. Okay, do you agree? And, and what applies to this rather obvious case, because it's a touristic attraction, then the whole area is, is, I mean, it's a money machine here. People come for, for 
for looking at the structure. And, and this approach actually applies also for everyday structures. Okay, this is the new mindset. And also it's a nice proof that actually uh, well-designed structures are durable. We can call them sustainable structures. Then life cycle engineering, okay. Here also, I think we can become a bit more ambitious. What we usually do and have accepted is this strategy B. I call it shark teeth approach. So it looks like a shark teeth, very sharp. And every 30 years, we, we have an intervention on the, on the concrete bridge. Come on, this is not normal. We should uh, develop technologies in order to, we have the right for one mistake, not more. But then we have to improve and we go on uh, in a durable way. Okay, at least for a very much longer period until we have to make an intervention again. This is what we have to get as a, an object, objective. Go for the green and leave the uh, strategy B that is still largely applied. So, the, after this introduction, improving the safety of bridges, first of all, I would like to talk about uh, required safety, some approach, then monitoring and UHPFRC interventions. And I've been looking on the program and I'm looking forward to your presentations or some of you. And I just picked out some terms uh, of your topics. And uh, risk assessment of aging bridge networks, risk management, water resources management, flood in urban areas, urban agriculture, risk related drinking water. So we have very often the term risk in it, risk and safety. And we care about the public. Public is in the center always. So I'm looking forward to your presentations also, and I would like to set a little bit the ground since I'm very bridge uh, related and other structures related. Um, uh, I use actually bridges only as a, let's say, as a, as a, as a certain type of uh, structure, as objects in order to uh, illustrate my um, messages. So let's look at this very nice uh, viaduct and uh, castle, very important uh, monument in Switzerland, Chillon Castle. And uh, actually, society expects that the failure of civil structures are extremely rare. Okay, there has been a very unfortunate issue uh, 2018, I think, in Italy. Everybody's talking about that. And uh, yeah, it's just showing that actually such cases should not occur. We have to do everything in order to avoid such extreme cases. And in our standards, we have about this definition of uh, safety or structural safety. We have to uh, keep on the control hazards. First of all, we have to understand what is the hazard or are the hazards that are involved. And then we have to take action have to take measures. We have to react and do something. And this is where the engineers are really doing their, their work. Other people might uh, understand, oh, there is a hazard here and there, but usually they don't know what to do. That's our task. That's why I think civil engineers have a very important future. And also we have to distinguish between what can be an acceptable risk as you know, we don't have, we cannot have 100% safety. There is always, always a small probability of occurring um, a failure. Yes. And uh, existing structures like uh, the whole built environment, that's actually, uh, we have to consider that as, as a richness. It's not the problem that costs money. Okay, it's a richness, it's a wealth. Did you ever calculate how much uh, built infrastructure you, you own as a citizen of this country? 
I calculated it for, for Switzerland. It's, uh, let me see now, I have to calculate back. It's almost 1 million uh, euro. Every person owns about 1 million of value of built environment, bridges, roads, uh, whatever. It's quite impressive. And we spend more money to maintain this, at least in Switzerland, a bit more money than for our health insurance, which is very high. It is a problem all the time in the newspapers. So um, um, in, in order to, to uh, uh, manage this uh, very high value, we, we have to, it's a major engineering task, yes, we need specific methods. You are certainly, you will certainly agree that uh, these methods are very different to the ones that you use in order to design a new building somewhere. That's easy. I'm provoking a bit, but that's easy. What's really difficult is how to deal with existing structures. And we have to answer such questions like how much safety do we need? And we have to take the responsibility for the answer. Okay, um, in this context, we can look at uh, what happens. So bridge failures also occur in Switzerland. And the most important uh, bridge failure was in the 19th century. This one in 1891, 73 deaths. And uh, it's not absolutely clear what the reason was, but there was uh, some distortion in the riveted steel structure and so on, fatigue related. And uh, yes, the structure collapsed. In the middle, we have uh, the Gotthard Highway, very important highway, north and south. And in 1987, there was a scour of a bridge pier here, came down by almost two meters, this place and so on. And there was no casualty here but a very high economic loss. So this is also very important for the social economic uh, context. And uh, they had to react very quickly. And actually they, they just uh, brought the structure back and uh, made new, new peers. I think in two months, everything was done and the uh, highway opened again. And then on the right-hand side is, uh, spectacular case of uh, failure during construction. That's the most dangerous uh, period, actually, the construction of uh, a structure and then the first two years. It's like, uh, yeah, here I can make a parallel to, to the human life. The very early stage is uh, sometimes very difficult. Okay. So from these lessons, and there are worldwide uh, statistics, worldwide studies and so on, I would like to uh, summarize what are the lessons from these failures. Most bridge failures are due to human error. Human error, it's so simple. People don't, uh, engineers don't uh, work as how they should work. So human be behavior has to be challenged. We will see how. And then 40% of all bridge accidents occurred during construction. Yes, I mentioned that already. So uh, we have to be very severe about the quality control during construction, monitoring during initial service life and so on. And maybe this has been uh, noticed and realized, but I think uh, nowadays, at least in my country, we have the trend to, to uh, have too many paperwork doing quality control. I'm impressed sometimes that what they write together, uh, what should be controlled. Uh, so my, my point is <clears throat> bring it down to some points really to control, but then you control it and you take action if something goes, is not correct. And so it's much better than having a too long checklist that nobody cares about in the end. Mm -hmm. Then failures due to natural hazards. Because, uh, for example, nowadays with the climate change or flood and so on, there are events that uh, our predecessors simply couldn't imagine. They occur now. So this has to do with hazard uh, 
scenarios uh, to identify them. Failure due to corrosion and fatigue occurs. Uh, yes, the tragic case goes into this direction that should be uh, actually uh, noticed by means of uh, monitoring and maintenance work. And then 8% of bridge failures are due to accepted risks. That means uh, underestimated risks, actually. Or also objectively unknown hazards. One could not imagine a certain hazard. Okay, uh, interesting information is as long as you follow correctly standards when you design a new structure, it should be okay. Okay, we can deduce from this that a higher structural safety is provided if uh, structural design and state of the art knowledge has been applied. Human factors have been considered. This goes through a, a, a strict project organization. Normal behavior of the structure during the first year of service. This has to do with uh, monitoring, with controls with observation, systematic and adequate monitoring and maintenance, yes. Now, measure one, what can we do in order to uh, improve safety as a, in general? No? This is now very general and should be applicable to, to any domain you are working on here in this room. Hazard recognition. To realize what is the problem or what are the problems, that's of very first importance. So, how to recognize all possible hazards? Because once you know what can occur, then it is relatively easy to take measures in order to, to uh, uh, reduce the hazard to an acceptable uh, level, risk level. Uh, we can uh, apply a chronological analysis approach. What, where, when? can occur. It's really a, a, a imagination is required. You have to sit down and think what can happen to my bridge I want to build or that I have to care for. Utilization al analysis, what could go wrong? Influence analysis, what quantities influence really the, the hazards, the risks? What are the parameters, the main parameters? When we look at flood, then of course we have to understand what is the surrounding nature, how is it built, and so on. Material and energy analysis, which materials can become hazardous? When we look at, for example, fire safety, it's quite obvious that we have to look at the, the, the fire potential, energy potential of the materials involved. Okay, measure two, organizational documents. This is quite uh, complex. You don't need to read that. But there are two uh, very important um, documents that we apply strictly in Switzerland, not in Europe, unfortunately. And this is the utilization plan. We sit together with the owner and define uh, how a structure is used existing or new one. What type of uh, utilization is used? Can we put trucks on the bridge or not? Is it just for cars? And so on. And uh, this plan is signed by everybody. So it's like a, a definition, an initial definition. What is the use of uh, a structure? And then we uh, have the safety plan with the description of hazard scenarios. So this is engineering work. Engineers are sitting down and, and uh, identify the hazards. What loads will act on it? Then we describe the loads. We can take codes and certain values and so on, load models. But this is a very important uh, plan. And also what measures are taken. If it is a new structure, it's very simple. Oh, we have to design appropriately. We have to give uh, appropriate dimensions to the structure and so on. In case of existing structures, it's a bit more complicated. The measure could also be we install a monitoring 
and we observe more precisely what happens on the structure. Okay, then control plan, inspection plan, maintenance plan, and so on. These are things, I mean, you give uh, the information to the owner what, what they have to do when they use the structure. When you buy a car, you have all that on the right hand side in that little box, they give you a maintenance manual. It's normal, no? Same goes for structures. <laughs> okay. So in Switzerland, we have uh, uh, strict uh, principles on this. And the owners really uh, are asking for it. Measure three, monitoring and maintenance. Monitoring to detect stru structural, abnormal structural behavior and actions as early as possible. The way we do inspections is, is fine. I'm not against the visual inspections, not at all. I do it also all the time, but we need to use much more um, technology, high performance technology, advanced technology, monitoring techniques, measurement techniques in order to, you, to detect as early as possible any damage that could occur. Something you cannot see. It's quite late when we see a problem on the structure. Okay? And this applies also to many other domains. So we need these uh, monitoring techniques. We know from the hazard study what are the important parameters involved. We can call them indicators. If these parameters show some abnormal sign, then we have to react at the very early stage then it costs not so much money it's like with our body i mean when you start to feel something it's maybe good to take some measures instead of waiting until they need to do surgery okay maintenance to preserve adequate structural performance i think this is obvious we should uh, clean and uh, and uh, do maintenance work already on our clothes and on structures and we should um, organize and we should have the money for it it's just implied into the use of uh, built infrastructure okay now um, as an example what we are doing in switzerland and also many other countries now also in italy is a so-called risk-based approach in bridge condition assessment and uh, what is risk? We uh, subdivide a structure or technical question into various uh, risk classes. When you know nothing, you always have three fingers, low, medium, high, okay? Doesn't need to be more complicated than this. And we, we give uh, risk classes to the structural elements uh, depending on on their role in the structure if, if i lose a struct here i think that will be the failure of both the structure but if i lose here just the curve the side part it's absolutely low risk okay and then the um, inspection work in the field looking at the current situation is is this uh, element state qualification the usual five level or five degrees approach good exposed vulnerable deteriorated defective we can give uh, like a letter or a number or whatever but the five levels is usually sufficient i know in some countries maybe in italy they have nine or even more i think it's too uh, sophisticated let's keep uh, that's the uh, thing. And then we, we multiply this and we get finally the element condition, which then gives the indication uh, really about the uh, state of a given structure. And we can, based on that, forecast already some budgets, some intervention plans, some uh, life cycle costing, and so on. So the message here is we should uh, integrate a risk consideration into uh, inspection, into maintenance plan, and so on. 
it's like uh, fireworks. They have to go there where it's burning. Okay, it's a matter of allocation. And in, like this, we are also improving uh, the safety of our infrastructure. Uh, yes, I think I can remove that. <laughs> Sorry, for Sorry for this, <laughs> but... <laughs> okay, let's go on. Now it's blocked. Doesn't move anymore. Oh, it's good. Now it's okay. Monitoring, this is now very bridge related, but it should give you an impression what, what is done in the bridge domain. So down there is my doctoral student some years ago sitting in the box of a, of a highway bridge and, and measuring up here in the slab with the sensors every truck, every car, everything that goes over the bridge. So this is just raw data. It should be just aesthetic. Don't read the numbers. But of course we have, we, we, we exploited or he exploited, I'm happy not to deal with big data. <laughs> uh, huge amount of, uh, of data, but nowadays with informatics, thanks to informatics, we can deal with this and we can uh, take out meaningful information that allows us to, to be much more precise when we have to give a, a value or an indication, is it, is there a fatigue problem or not? What can we put on this bridge as high or low? Based on this information, we, we are much more precise than simply calculation. Most engineers, they like to calculate. They love to calculate. And they even believe in their numbers. It's amazing. <laughs> really. And the experienced engineer, I, I check uh, also their work. And uh, what they are not doing is actually a plausibility check. Is this meaningful? What I have on paper, on my screen when I calculate, is it meaningful when I compare with, with what I see outside? I mean, you can go outside on an existing structure, you can climb in it, you can look at it. Sometimes they, they, they calculate a huge amount of cracks. Should there be? And you go on the structure, see nothing. It's just working properly. So this this contradiction has to be uh, explained. This is one fundamental difference between design of new and working with existing. In the existing world, you have to explain when something is in good condition. You cannot just uh, deliver a, uh, unsafe, uh, calculated uh, safety numbers. Okay. While in the new domain, uh, it's not yet existing, so they put some more uh, rebars in it. Uh, okay, nobody cares. That's easy. Yes, I think uh, modern engineering firms, they have a monitoring kit because they are able to have uh, advanced nonlinear finite element models. And they pay money for that. Significant amount of money. And I think it's very good. But on the same level, such engineering firms can have monitoring kit. They can install this and do uh, that work. It's not so complicated. Metro 4, combating human error. Uh, of course, this has to do with uh, training. This has to do also with uh, psychology. We can publish examples of bad experiences, uh, learning from others, from mistakes, of course. So this has to do a lot with uh, regular life as private persons. Huh? Clear allocation of responsibility and competences. We need a clear project structure and so on. Combating all mm -hmm. forms of carelessness, negligence, and ignorance, mm -hmm. because this is what is occurring case of problems. Really, it's very low human behavior requiring clear and ambiguous, unambiguous documents. 
again, control four eyes, see more than just two eyes and all these approaches. Okay, now target safety level very quickly. There are, there's quite a rich literature about uh, uh, the necessary target reliability levels. And in case of existing structures, they, they are unique and actually we can look at each existing structure uh, specifically and given the condition, also given what has been um, the experience in, in the past. Um, I think I would like to jump on this table. Do you know this table actually? Who has seen this table where we have uh, the efficiency of intervention to, to decrease the risks and the consequences of structural failure? So it's like a matrix in structural engineering, it's very well accepted. It defines the target safety level. We agree on, on the probability of occurrences, yearly probabilities of occurrences of uh, structural failure. And this has to do also with uh, efficiency. This means in terms of economic efficiency. What can we, um, the safety money, uh, the safety measure does cost money. So we have here a ratio between the reduction of R is risk and to say uh, the money that we invest in order to reduce the risk. That's one parameter, the efficiency. And the consequences of uh, the failure is failure cost, the cost that the failure produces with respect to the restoration cost. So, for example, when we have, uh, I don't know, a huge flood because a dam breaks, to restore a, a broken uh, dam is probably not so expensive compared to the uh, economic damage that it produces in the whole area. So, it's this ratio. And we, we can apply this approach to, um, again, to uh, actually each structural element on the bridge. And uh, we can allocate uh, uh, failure probabilities to each uh, structural element as a function of the risk. And we have quite differences here. The lowest risk level that we would accept is 10 to the power of minus three, one case per thousand per year. And in the highest level, it's uh, one per one million. So these are the safeties that we kind of consider in structural in engineering domain. It's very important to apply this on existing structures. When we design new, it's simple. We simply apply that implicitly. And that's okay. We do not need to um, uh, go more in detail. Okay, this is just a conversion. Usually we talk about the uh, safety index beta, but there is a direct relation between beta values and and, uh, and these small uh, probability, failure probability values. And of course, when we analyze an existing structure, we can, we can actually apply probabilistic methods and we find out what the failure probabilities of that and that value. And this value should be smaller than the target value. This is the safety uh, verification. It's not so easy to do, but it can be done. Okay. Now let me come to uh, UHPFRC interventions. How are we time-wise, actually? Because you have to stop me. Okay. Okay. I will try my best. When professors speak, uh, you really have to stop them. <laughs> okay, let me go quickly through this. Um, we have always the same problems on existing reinforced concrete bridges. So let me state here, reinforced concrete is not durable, period. It's a huge problem we have. Even if we build new, it's not durable. We will have, we'll have to do interventions in 30 years, for sure. This is the red side, 
often it's the top, a top layer of the slab. <coughs> Reinforced concrete is not made for de-icing salts. <laughs> it's, it's, does not uh, behave very well when we are close to seawater, marine environment. The problem is, it's uh, uh, products can penetrate into the concrete. It's like a sponge; everything can go. In. What we need is actually a better material where we have high uh, solicitation, also in terms of stress, tech slabs of bridges. The trucks are beating on, on these slabs. So here we need a real good uh, materials. It's a very simple approach, basic approach. Let's use this uh, UHPFRC material where it is needed, where we have high stress, where we need durability, exposed reinforced concrete needs to be uh, protected. And often we have to increase the structural capacity of slabs, so we get the protective uh, watertight layer and also we increase significantly the structural capacity. So this is in two sentences, uh, a summary of 25 years of research with about 15 doctoral theses. Okay. So here you see the material looks like this, looks very different to concrete. But we combine the two, of course, because we want to create the uh, composite system. Once again, very quickly, it, the material is impermeable. It has a very optimized uh, packing density of particles, mostly cement and other powders, limestone filler, fly ash, quartz particles, and so on, smaller than one millimeter. So it has nothing to do with concrete. In concrete, you put stones, 30 millimeters and so on. And the white dots are, are fibers, steel fibers. Huge amount of steel fibers. Has nothing to do with uh, fiber reinforced concrete, by the way. Only little amount of uh, fibers in, in FRC. So this is UHPFRC. It's a completely new material. It's watertight and crack free under the service conditions. Okay, it, it has a tensile behavior, stress, strain, a bit similar to steel, elastic, hardening, softening. And the values are quite high, relatively high. It's not astonishing because we have so much steel in it. Okay, compressive strength, yes, 150 megapascal in about. And with this material, we can uh, do uh, these interesting things. We combine reinforced concrete and, and UHPFRC. The objective is to fulfill several functions with just one layer. Increase the resistance in bending and shear, increase stiffness to reduce fatigue stresses, because these are always the questions we have with reinforced concrete structures from the 1960s, 70s, and so on, and also act as a waterproofing layer. These are mostly the, the functions we need to fulfill. Now, um, we get, if uh, appropriate measures are taken, we get the perfect bond here. When you cool on, on uh, such a composite situation, it will crack in the concrete. Okay, intervention objectives, uh, we put a, a layer on it, uh, including rebars. The red line is a rebar, and we distinguish between mocking domain with negative bending moments, positive bending moments, and so on. Without going into details, um, this concept allows to uh, strengthen text labs, and we cast only from the top. Okay, but with this concept, we can handle uh, most uh, problems. Now, we, are, we, cannot, uh, we can also improve the resistance and the waterproofing of uh, girders. Let's look at the box girder, but it's very similar for other cross sections too. Again, we add uh, a thicker layer over peers where we have a uh, uh, negative bending moment here in the hardening domain in order to attract bending moments to the 
a negative uh, bending moment area. Because it's very easy to, to add here a huge amount of capacity, tensile capacity. Of course, we need to check that we have sufficient compressive uh, strength down here in the existing concrete. Otherwise, we have to strengthen also in the bottom part. But there is one excellent quality with uh, concrete, the strength increases in time. It's not rare that in Switzerland we, we measure on a 60-year-old uh, reinforced concrete structure strength up in the 60 or 70 megapascal domain, which is very high. And also we can uh, strengthen here the shear problem. This is very effective, such a tension cord in order to increase the shear capacity. Okay, now in many countries, in particular in, in Italy, you have many joints, single span structures, too many. Okay, so this is one, uh, this is one objective for intervention of objective number three. We close all, all joints, okay? Don't even think about putting a new uh, dilation joint. They are never watertight. And, and you can do that without, now it's, You can do that without calculations up to bridge lengths of 100 meters. Our colleagues did that already and just go for it. So here we have the situation of, of a girder joint. We, we block all this, we remove existing concrete, it's heavily uh, damaged and so on, and then we just close it brutally with this uh, material. But then we have a uh, uh, rescued the situation, or this is at an abutment also, we just block it here with the massive uh, material. And this is uh, when you have a series of uh, single span words, we can uh, link just the top part slack like this. Forget about dilation choice. And most structures, let's say uh, in, in the bridge domain, 95% of all bridges, are shorter than 100 meters. 80 percent are shorter than 20 meters. They have all, or many of them, have dilation joints. It's a very effective means to solve that problem. Okay, just some impressions from the construction side. We have in Switzerland something like 400 uh, applications already realized on bridges and also in some buildings, slabs. Our companies, they have, uh, they are equipped with uh, uh, special equipment designed and built for it in order to cast very quickly this uh, UHVFRC material. You see here some, some important rebars we are over up here. Okay, we increase the negative bending moment capacity. It goes very quickly. We are three times faster than old fashioned traditional methods and so on. Or here, also an impression. It's just now being, it became a routine application in order to fix uh, our bridges and also buildings, existing buildings. It helps to keep them in service, to improve them in order to, to uh, look at the future. They always ask me, oh, for, for how much time this will be? I never know to, to give a good answer because uh, when I say, oh, th this is forever. As long as you drive your, your trains, we, we, this, this is fine for it. And uh, I would like to finalize uh, with the most recent application. It's a first post-tensioned uh, concrete structure the beautiful mountains, it has exactly my age. And we had to widen the structure. It's in remote areas. We initially uh, only put 5.3 meters, but nowadays we need a 50% more width. So that's important uh, additional load that the structure has to take. Of course, <clears throat> uh, there was already a project to replace that structure. And, and we said, no, 
we can uh, keep the structure and uh, and change the static system what would you do this could be a test question for students <laughs> let's say master students last year you have a single span structure and, and the two abutments here they are like two piers okay and we need to increase the load bearing capacity at least by 50 percent a bit more even exactly 65 percent what can you do and the answer is actually you create the half frame structure block here the uh the situation of the Siemens fan B, we create sufficient uh tensile capacity up here and we create a situation such that we can take compressive forces here such that um, the loads the stresses can actually follow this uh half frame and we realize all this with your c this is what we did this is what we realized this is the cross section we need to widen it and we use just uhbfrc we can reduce the dimensions here that's also for sustainability reason material use reason we only use as little as possible quantities of this uh, precious and costly material and uh, yes this is all sport here and indication how the static system works so this is a very nice example to uh, illustrate our basic approach you have to understand materials and statics mechanics of structures and combine both elegantly then we find excellent or we find uh, good solutions for our structures so it has been built this summer this is uh, one half has been realized. The bracket is now on this half, and the other half will be realized. That was back in August, and we added here multiple fiber for research reasons because we are curious. Uh, yes, let me make the remark: sustainability is preservation of existing structures, thanks to the use of a small amount of UH papers. Okay. And very recently, we made a, a load test. So that's our team here. And we have put some trucks on it. Uh, we did measure in the optical fiber uh, deflections, accelerations, and so on. And uh, my younger colleagues have now the pleasure to look at all the data. I will just look at the reports then, <laughs> the results. I'm happy. Uh, but it's a nice example also to, to um, learn how it really functions precisely. So I can already tell you the first uh, checks showed that uh, the structure is, is uh, functioning according to the new imagined structural system. It's much, much stiffer and can take easily the additional load and so on. Let me finish with uh, this very recent uh, diagram. That my uh, co worker, Numa Bertola, who will become professor at the University of Luxembourg, he produced this uh, last week, so two days, uh, two weeks ago. Now we have the carbon footprint in terms of uh, CO2 emissions, okay? Per square meter of bridge, useful bridge surface. This is uh, what I call in gray, the traditional end of life approach. That means we demolish the bridge and build a new one. Okay, the usual approach, unfortunately. We are up here. And we know from literature and also from own cases where uh, we have such a approach to begin with, that the valleys are up here, let's say uh, 2,420. And here are some applications, UHPFRC applications, even on very large structures. We have here the bridge length. Maybe it's more objective to talk really about the bridge uh, total useful surface, but that's uh, detailed. And we are down at, let's say, 150. 
So you see, uh, there is a factor of about 10. So we are 10 times better or 10 times less CO2 emissions with the UHPFRC approach, keeping the existing structure, improving it with a little amount of UHPFRC, and then it's okay for the future. It's even much better than, than old fashioned reinforced, the new old fashioned reinforced concrete structure. It's even much better. This is what I call having a strong impact on its uh, CO2 emission uh, question. So it's an average value 90% reduction. Okay, with this, if I can conclude. We talked about measures and safety approach. Monitoring is important. This you should keep in your mind. Also, when you are working in, in drinking water area, you also have to monitor certain parameters. Very important. And then we can have new technologies, often new materials that really help us to improve the situation. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for this very nice presentation. We have time for a couple of questions. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I do not work in the field of bridges. <laughs> I'm a flood out of the expert, okay. And I was impressed by the probability of failure that we are sure more because, for example, for us, a very low probability, the probability of one hundred plus of a five hundred, one to five hundred here, okay. And you show something like uh, one in one billion zeros failure, the probability of failure. So my question is that. Uh, how this uh, level of safety was defined, which is the process leading to this uh, probability of failure? The, yeah, if there is a sort of, yeah. I think uh, no, no, no. you are putting at the same level to be the return. Yes. And the probability of failure of failure. That's not the same. No, it's Because in the domain of uh, love, other natural assets, snowfall, and so on, much more looking at the energy or cost sizing action. This event can occur a long time uh, in we may 500 years, yeah. things like this. And then we accept a lot. And that's a different way of thinking, a different way of, of putting safety and market safety level than looking at the probabilities of pain. Yes. Yeah, no, no. The distinction for me is clear. My oh. question is how that probability is working. Yeah. I mean, uh, which is the process? Oh, you mean the in the chain? Yeah, of the probability of pain. That was the joint committee of structural safety. Okay. And was it 20 years ago? Yeah. Years. yeah. So a group of, of experts, I was not a member of that group at that time. And so they established that table and uh, it's applied, it's applied in the Euro calls and so on, and we may actually do it here in the field. So uh, it's we'll stay like right. this. Okay, now the second question. When you said that 10% of uh, accidents of fuels because of uh, mm -hmm. you said that uh, the uh, probability of failure was not uh, calculated right. And uh, what does it mean? It's because if they are all rigid, and so there was a higher level of uh, probability, is there a uh, lower level of state if you don't know? Okay, you are referring to the slide where we said at the very end, 80% is because of uh, the or reasons that they we couldn't know or underestimate. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And other estimated risks goes back to the hazard identification. Okay. So this process where you have to think what can occur. You lose the case or you do not properly consider the hazard. Okay. Then of course you this could lead to a Okay. 
Once again, that's the identification is most important. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks. We have time for another question. Just the common uh, it's the interface between uh, the interior and the concrete. Because particularly in southern Europe, the problem is often with the concrete and the rails. So I wonder if you have been looking at the applications or small low strength. Yes, actually we have a requirement for a minimum uh, strength of the concrete substrate. And this is in the C uh C plane. Or you should have it. So I was in Japan recently, and they also have very low strength concrete. Surprise! And uh, how low is the compression strength? Well, it depends, depends on the type of building. Yeah, in buildings, I think in buildings, yes. I'd be waiting more on the way to get the C8. Yeah, yeah. Because then the risk is, is just uh, 100 percent that uh, it will immediately fracture the substrate. You can always get it to form, but it will immediately fracture. But what we can do, and this is what our standard says, you have to really check the stress at the interface and to, to verify that this low strength concrete substrate can take this uh, shear horizontal shear stress. If you have a higher strength, you don't need to change that. Thank you, time for the last question. Eugene, thank you very much for the time. And uh, you start that uh, your presentation talking about the field. So, learning by fields have been always part of our growing advantage, but not all, all fields are the same. Some I can't fail with that because of uh, dramatic consequences, uh, the demographic opinion. A new direction and uh, um, develop new awareness uh, about problems to be solved. For example, the life cycle uh, assessment and design of bridges, uh, uh, one of the problems was the incorporation in practice. We have very well established methodologies and developed over the last 20 years about uh, how to implement them in practice at the moment of the problem. Because uh, public authorities, uh, bridge owners, uh, and uh, managing bodies are very reluctant. To incorporate this concept into practice, uh, but it's because of uh, perhaps uh, uh, lack of ground, uh, problem. But uh, in the last five years, the situation in Italy changed uh, quite significantly, uh, and then we've also been done for the course of the big period we had in general that we recorded in the main. Offer your view of this for us. This brings us to the very basic. This brings us to the very basic uh, uh, question: How to convince others? So we have this in Switzerland: this UHPFRC technology. Little Switzerland and Italy, there is no application, as far as I know. Why is this? Of course, I'm very happy in this domain. And for 20 years, I mean, it was not important. Convincing people with arguments, not scientific, technical arguments, and so on. And uh, you have to be very uh, persistent and uh, go your way, you know the objectives, and then you have to convince the people 10 times. And then on the 11th time, they come still back. Yeah, but how do we get this form to put the figures? And they explain it already 10 times. And you explain it in the 11th time. And you will say, oh, okay. <laughs> That's the way it is. How to work with human beings, convincing people. And, and then you have to convince. Uh, and convince. Well, well, this is work this not without uh, waiting for that. But then it also has to go with, with the education of the past law. There are more or less competent things that's yes. And this is an important role, of course, like 
in the university here at my university provide the best education possible. This is also sustainable. I'm starting to study psychology and then to understand how people function and what people why do to not do what they should do, obviously. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can move to our internal speaker, and the first one is uh, Luca Capacci. And the title of the talk of Luca is Life Cycle, Scientific Resilience, and Risk Assessment of Aging Bridge Networks. So, thank you. For the presentation, I'm Dr. Luca Capacci. I'm an um, assistant junior professor uh, here at the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering. And the uh, topic of the presentation, uh, my presentation of today, will be related to life cycle, seismic resilience, and risk assessment of aging bridge networks. So, uh, the presentation stems from recent research activities and advances on the topic of life cycle resilience uh, of deteriorating lifelines. So, the outline. Uh, of the presentation here starts from uh, this this topic. Then I'll briefly introduce uh, probabilistic uh, methodologies that are established in literature regarding uh, resilience and seismic risk uh, assessment, uh, uh, specifically related to aging bridges uh, and uh, um, aging bridge networks as a whole. And then, before drawing some final conclusions, I'll deal with uh, a brief numerical application related to uh, simulation based. Uh, estimates of seismic risk for a simplified uh, road network. So, uh, among all civil infrastructure systems, roads and bridge networks clearly play a key role in uh, the aftermath of the occurrence of extreme events such as earthquakes because they ensure a quick deployment of uh, emergency aids to distressed communities where they are stricken by the earthquakes and also a prompt repair of all the damaged uh, buildings or lifelines in the surroundings. So, um, it is critical in this context to define uh, performance indicators that are able to quantify how a system is actually resilient. That is, how it's capable to resist an extreme event, absorb its impact, uh, and also to recover as efficiently, as rapidly as possible, the pre-event conditions. So, in order to quantify resilience, typical methodology rely on the definition of uh, a functionality metric that uh, tends to drop in, uh, due to the occurrence of uh, an extreme event, such as, for example, earthquakes. The functionality is an overall measure of the performance of the system, and there will be a little time necessary to design the repair activities to consume them, and then their implementation allow restoring progressively the capacity of single damaged items and ultimately the functionality as a whole. So resilience is typically quantified as the integral mean of such functionality profile from the time of occurrence of the extreme event up to a fixed reference horizon time. And it's critical to obviously point out that during the system lifetime, uh, functionality and recovery processes are affected by deterioration processes. And so, um, not, not only, let's say, by uh, abrupt events due to earthquake occurrences, but also due to uh, mechanical deterioration of the, the materials involved uh, in the system. So, resilience should not be intended as a static property of these systems are actually as a dynamic property evolving through time. So typical methodologies that we can uh, uh, rely on to quantify resilience, to assess resilience in a rich network, uh, tend to relate uh, to um, worlds together. Rich damage and the progressive restoration, so the physical damage suffered by uh, the structures with uh, eventual traffic responses uh, at the road network scale. So the physical damage which is suffered by each single bridge in the network 
should be related to traffic limitations that the infrastructure managers are called to apply to the network uh, to guarantee the safety of road users. And this clearly has an impact at the network scale with the drop in functionality that I mentioned before. And then the physical damage is progressively repaired through the post-event uh, restoration action of the load carrying capacity at the structural level. And this relates to the progressive release of those traffic restrictions imposed by the infrastructure managers, impacting functionality and leading to a damage-based measure of the seismic resilience. These kind of uh, uh, frameworks are clearly affected by large deal of uncertainties. Typically in a risk assessment framework, we deal with three components that encompass risk that are related to hazard, fragility or vulnerability and exposure. Regarding uh, hazards uh, in this kind of framework, uh, environmental aggressiveness is one of the two critical hazards that relentlessly lead to deterioration in time. For example, in reinforced concrete bridges, we can deal with uh, uh, corrosion processes. And uh, uncertainties are also related to earthquake hazard scenarios. And they can be taken into account by tools such as uh, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis that are well established to quantify these uncertainties. The hazards uh, clearly affect then uh, the uh, damage occurrence uh, of uh, um, at the network scale of single bridges in the network. And typically, we quantify uncertainties associated to structural capacity coping with the hazard based on the concept of uh, fragility curves. They are the probability of occurrence of a specific uh, damage event, actually of exceedance of a specific damage event given uh, over the abscissa in the graph which you see here at the top right uh, given uh, the seismic intensity at the bridge site and we can quantify this kind of uh, um, analytical tools uh, uh, based on structural analysis methods for example incremental dynamic analysis uh, or multi-stripe analysis deterioration processes uh, lead to variation in time of these fragility curves they should be taken into account uh, as time-dependent fragility cars rather than just static in time. Now, the measure of resilience that I introduced before could be configured as a, an overall measure of the exposure of the system. It quantifies at the network scale the consequences of damage. And also here in the recovery process, there's a large deal of uncertainties that we should deal with. An effective metric of seismic risk encompassing these three components of uh, risk itself uh, is given by the mean annual rate of uh, exceedance of a certain uh, threshold value, a target that we can apply to the resilience metric. Now, the case study that I'll very briefly introduce to just uh, draw some numbers and clarify the concepts of simulation-based uh, risk metrics uh, is the one that we see here at the left-hand side. So it's a road network composed by three nodes, it would be three cities in a, a prescribed area. They are connected by a main highway with a single vulnerable bridge along the way and by a uh, tour road that still uh, accounts for the connectivity between the cities, the nodes, uh, even when uh, a single bridge is damaged along the, the network. Uh, the, uh, system functionality is uh, actually measured based uh, on shortest path analysis over the road network, uh, given the traffic flows, uh, the uh, road arc length and the uh, limit uh, speed uh, that is uh, collected here at the top right in the slide. The effect of environmental aggressiveness leading to time variancy in the resilience and risk metrics uh, is taken into account uh, with uh, 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 median capacity of, the, of each of the three bridges uh, to be variant in time, leading to time variant fragility curves that are presented here at the right center. Now, typically, risk metrics, uh, risk analysis is carried out uh, with a simulation based approach. Here, there's a small video, yeah, that mm, qualitatively show 
the kind of uh, um, evolution of this matrix uh, based uh, on the simulation process uh, that is carried out. So the underlying uncertainties are related to basic random variable, for example, related to hazard, earthquake magnitude, uh, and the epicenter location tend to be scattered over the seismogenic area source that's represented here surrounding the three bridges. And here we can see <clears throat> also in the scatter graph that's evolving here at the top left, uh, that we have a relatively small number of uh, events for which uh, uh, damage occurs leading to a drop in the resilience compared to the perfectly performance system, accounting for all the uncertainties in the problem. And uh, uh, so this is made evident also looking at the uh, graph here that we have uh, at the right hand side, top right hand side, with the evolving uh, histogram related to the damage occurrence of a single bridge. And clearly we see that the safety margin tends to be lower than uh, zero. So when capacity tends to be lower than the uh, applied demand uh, on a very limited number and very narrow times. At the bottom, we can see for a fixed uh, time instant, uh, specifically the pristine condition of the infrastructure, the evolution of the mean hour rate uh, and its qualitative uh, convergence uh, for two different uh, resilience target scenarios, and we can see that the metrics uh, tend with increasing the number of simulation to um, stabilize, uh, while quantitatively we can measure such uh, convergence rate uh, through the coefficient of variation of the reliability estimates that we are evaluating. Now, this kind of uh, numerical approaches tend to be extremely computationally demanding. We need a very large number of simulations to actually carry out uh, uh, to, to actually evaluate a reliable estimate of risk. So uh, recent advances have been developing uh, on uh, um, advanced simulation technique involving, uh, for example, important sampling with a cross-entropy stationary proposal approach uh, that allow us to evaluate uh, in time the mean hour rate of exceedance of certain resilience target with a way, way, way lower coefficient of variation compared to traditional Monte Carlo simulation. So I'll just keep all the analytical inside for the sake of time and not to bore you out. But the idea is to apply this kind of uh, advanced simulation techniques to actually have meaningful risk metrics and uh, ultimately just, a, um, let's say, a hook for the conclusions that I'm going to deliver right away. Uh, this kind of approaches uh, to risk assessment can be useful to plan optimal intervention strategies within the network. For example, here at the right hand side, we have the mean annual rate of uh, exceedance of resilience metrics uh, given uh, a retrofit intervention that basically uh, resets the seismic capacity to the pristine condition for either one bridge, top right graph, or two bridges, bottom right graph. Um, uh, with this application of intervention at uh, 30 years of age. So just to summarize the, the conclusion, I report uh, a synthetic flowchart, actually a bit cumbersome probably, but this, the idea here is actually to uh, give you an idea of the multidisciplinarity of uh, this kind of approaches, because we are dealing with uh, hazards, fragility and exposure, at many different scales uh, at the regional level. So seismic resilience uh, and risk are inherently no stationary properties. They need, need to be evaluated through time. And the ultimate aim of this kind of methodologies is to develop concepts and tools uh, for optimal decision making, both at the ex ante preventive maintenance uh, and retrofit stage, uh, and uh, also at the ex post emergency phase with optimal recovery strategies. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Luca. We have time for one question or two. Any question? Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering what type of structure has been analyzed so it's a bit post-concrete, less concrete. So um 
type of structure. Here is not actually presented. The fragility graphs have been uh, defined uh, for uh, based on a taxonomic selection of, um, let's say, a taxonomic um, um, classification of bridges. Uh, these are related to reinforced concrete bridges uh, with uh, extremely uh, decaying uh, value of the capacity over time uh, based on, let's say, uh, literature available data. Um, in other activities here, it's not presented uh, in detail. Uh, uh, I've been working with uh, the assessment of uh, reinforced concrete bridges, traditional reinforced concrete bridges affected by uh, chloride induced corrosion. So, in, evaluating in time the deterioration of the uh, capacity of the piers uh, of the bridges. And uh, we can, uh, through this kind of approach with structural analysis at different time instances, uh, calibrate uh, the fragility bars with uh, the structural analysis tools. There are, of course, uh, um, there's a wide range. Of possible ways to quantify the fragility curves. And the simplest one is with a minimal amount of data, accounting for a lot of uncertainties, so large dispersions uh, related to the lack of knowledge. Uh, we can draw some numerical values. The more information we have, the more computational power we have along with it, the more accurate we can be reducing the dispersion. I believe there is a certain lack of information, particularly because most testing has been done on feet. Sure. So, this is some literature on how many forms of problems, much less than. Sure. It's something that's developing more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. If we don't have any other questions, we can thank you again. And the next speaker is Mattia Anguilleri. And the, talk, uh, the title of this talk is Life Cycle Structural Performance of Concrete Bridges, Computational Modeling and Discriminate Validation. So, please, Matthias, you can start. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Matteo Angileri. I'm a research fellow at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and I would like to present this research contribution addressing the life cycle structural performance of concrete bridges with particular emphasis on the computational modeling and the experimental uh, validation. So this is the content of my uh, presentation, which starts with an introduction about the life cycle structural assessment of aging bridges, with emphasis on the effect of corrosion, steel corrosion, and the damage modeling. Uh, then the structural assessment is performed through uh, no linear structural analysis on reinforced concrete and pressurized concrete bridges through the use of uh, two finite element formulation that are then experimentally validated uh, by means of experimental tests on reinforced concrete beams under corrosion and um, through an experimental campaign on the dismantled uh, bridge, um, recently dismantled in Italy. So, as we know, in the last case, the uh, increasing traffic demand combined, combined with the long term exposure uh, um, scenario to aggressive environment and also the high vulnerability to hazardous, hazardous event. Uh, introduce very big changes in the uh, loading exposure scenario and the um, residual performance of existing bridges. Uh, moreover, the uh, inspection and the maintenance activity uh, has been generally performed through a reactive approach rather than a preventive uh, strategy. Uh, this is also reflected into the uh, recent bridge failure event and the large amount of repair uh, needs that are nowadays required in order to guarantee safe. Uh, uh, reliable and sustainable bridges. Within this context, a life cycle perspective is nowadays widely uh, recognized as a crucial component in order to take into account the effect of aging and deterioration, the effect of both aleatory and epistemic uncertainties, and also the effect of maintenance and, uh, and repair intervention. So, as also reported by uh, several studies, the um, exposure of concrete structures to aggressive environment may generally uh, introduce um, may affect particularly in time the bearing capacities to service loads. Um, um, this slide shows an example of several of some of the uh, life cycle criteria and methodologies that have been uh, proposed in the last decades in order to take into account the effect of uh, aging and deterioration. As an example, on the right, uh, 
um, the slide shows the diffusion process of chloride in an existing uh, pressurized concrete uh, uh, bridge PR cap. And despite the fact that uh, several life cycle criterion method has been nowadays um, uh, established for most of the damage scenarios, such as steel corrosion, uh, this model are generally very sensitive to the change of probabilistic data, particularly for uh, damage uh, scenario. Um, and an accurate calibration is generally a difficult task to be performed because of limited availability of data, particularly for existing bridges. So this proposed uh, effort are still needed in order to gather uh, information of new data uh, and validate experimentally those methodologies, particularly considering the effect of aging and uh, deterioration. So that's why my presentation will focus mostly on the uh, use of finite element formulation and the experimental validation of those uh, methodologies based on experimental uh, campaign. Uh, starting considering the uh, effect of steel corrosion, the experimental evidence clearly show that the main effect of uh, corrosion of steel in concrete regard three main topics, uh, steel mass loss associated to cross-sectional area reduction, uh, steel ductility uh, influence, which may um, uh, lead to a uh, reduction of the ductility and therefore to brittle failures, and also to concrete damage associated to the corrosion product that may um, that are generally introduced in uh, in concrete. This kind of uh, effect are generally modeled to time variant damage indices based and calibrated based on experimental uh, experimental data. Then passing through the uh, structural analysis, generally this is uh, performed by means of finite element formulation. Several approaches have been proposed in the last decades in order to uh, deal with uh, different compromise among multiple factors, including the simplicity of the formulation, the accuracy of the solution process, and the computational cost. Uh, two different finite element approaches are used in this research uh, uh, study. Uh, first finite element formulation that has been selected for its uh, stability and for the low computational cost is a beam finite element formulation. Uh, which can account both material and geometrical non-linearities. And the slide shows the uh, governing equation, the hypothesis of the uh, finite element formulation, and also a schematic view of this uh, finite element, uh, being finite element formulation. This is generally quite effective in reproducing the uh, uh, flexible behavior of the beam element, but um, despite the high accuracy and the low computational cost, when also shear effect and local stress uh, phenomena become relevant, a more general um, formulation is generally needed. Uh, this proposed also a bidimensional brain stress finite element formulation is used, formulated in accordance with the modified compression theory. Here again, the slide shows the uh, governing equation, the main hypothesis of this uh, approach. Now, as mentioned, this uh, finite element formulation combined with the uh, damage modeling previously introduced are adopted and are validated based on experimental data. Particularly, uh, some experimental campaign has been considered uh, from uh, literature review in order to validate those methodologies uh, for reinforced concrete beam under both accelerated and natural corrosion uh, tests. This slide shows two examples, two experimental campaigns associated to uh, reinforced concrete beam, uh, characterized by a rectangular uh, cross section. And the two diagrams on the right shows the comparison between experimental and numerical results in terms of load versus uh, mid fan displacement for the um, numerical versus uh, experimental results under different loading uh, scenarios. A third experimental campaign is here reported again for reinforced concrete beams associated with rectangular cross section uh, under chloride induced uh, corrosion. The two diagrams on the, uh, on the bottom part of the slide shows again the comparison between experimental and numerical results for the uh, load versus the displacement uh, comparison of the two finite element uh, formulations. Now, as mentioned, this, uh, the validation of these uh, methodologies is also important to be achieved also with experimental data uh, considering existing bridges. And in order to uh, the objective of catering new data from existing structures, the Bridge 50 research project has been launched uh, in 2019 in order to evaluate the residual performance of a 15 year old uh, restressed concrete bridge. 
this research project involves several partners, starting from Politecnico Milano and Politecnico Torino, and also several public authorities and private companies uh, involved into the research uh, project. As I mentioned, the project is aimed at evaluating the residual performance of an old uh, uh, stressed concrete bridge. The experimental campaign of this project involves several activities, starting with the dismantling phase uh, of the viaduct and several uh, experimental tests, starting with non-destructive tests, laboratory tests, um, uh, procedure in order to evaluate the residual pre-stressing level, and also full-scale tests performed on several uh, concrete elements in order also to experimentally validate life cycle uh, method and uh, criteria. The dismantled bridge, uh, named Corso Corsetto Viaduct, was an 80 uh, span double deck bridge built in the 1970, so after uh, the dismantled after a lifetime of almost 15 years. It was characterized by a total length of almost 1.4 kilometers. Uh, the bridge span were uh, ranging from 16 to 24 meters with a simply supported structural scheme, and the bridge deck was made by uh, eight high-shaped beams, two lateral pressed concrete beams, box beam, and a casting seat to uh, reinforce concrete uh, slab. Uh, during the demolition of this phase of this uh, viaduct due, due to um, um, a development, a new development of the of the urban area where the viaduct was located, uh, two adjacent span were was dismantled and several elements has been moved in a testing site, in particular uh, a total of 29 processed concrete beams and two processed concrete pier caps have been moved in this uh, testing site. Now, the presentation will mostly focus on the application about the eye shaped beams. Um, these slides show the main characteristic of this element, which are pre-stressed concrete precast uh, deck beams, characterized by a total length of almost uh, 19.4 meters. Um, they are characterized by an eye shaped cross section along the longitudinal axis of the bridge and a rectangular cross section at the two extreme uh, regions. Uh, the pre-stressing system is characterized by 20 pre-stressing strands, and the uh, mechanical characteristic of the beam has been uh, evaluated uh, after a lifetime of 15 years through several uh, activities, starting from non-destructive tests, laboratory tests, and also uh, procedure in order to evaluate the residual pre-stressing level. Uh, the uh, large amount of data, uh, due to also the large amount of element that has been collected in this testing site allow also a probabilistic description of this uh, mechanical uh, parameter. Then, as mentioned, in the experimental campaign of this research project, also full-scale load test has been uh, performed using a steel reaction uh, frame. Here, the slide shows the schematic view of those uh, tests. Uh, the experimental setup that has been designed in order to capture both the global behavior of the beam during the experimental test, but also the local uh, mechanisms of the uh, elements during the experimental test through the use of cable operator sensor and uh, linear variable displacement uh, transducer. The full scale test has been performed under different loading scenarios, starting with the three point bending test in order to promote uh, flexor failure, but also four point bending test in order to uh, um, study also the effect of shear. Uh, this test has been also performed under different uh, uh, scenario, considering the case of the precast beam with or without the top slab, and also under different damage scenario, considering the effect of notional damage uh, effect. Now, the, um, the results of this full scale load test are here adopted in order to validate the finite element formulation previously introduced. Uh, in order to start investigating the effect of the, uh, the residual uh, performance of the beam only, a first full-scale load test has been performed on the beam after the removal of the top uh, slab, and particularly considering, as shown in the picture, a three-point bending test, again, in order to promote the flexural uh, failure. And the outcomes of this uh, full-scale load test have been adopted in order to uh, evaluate the finite element formulation for the two uh, methodologies. Therefore, the, uh, the diagram on the bottom part of the slide shows the comparison between the experimental and the numerical results for the two finite element formulation, the beam finite element formulation for the first diagram and the uh, modified compression field theory based formulation for the figure in the middle part. Um, 
in this case, comparing the uh, capacity curve in terms of load versus mid-span displacement. The um, load protocol consists of a first loading phase up to concrete cracking, a stop uh, of the load and, and a loading phase in order to assess the uh, cracking uh, pattern and a final reloading up to the collapse of the overall beam. Here, the comparison has been done not only considering the global behavior of the, of the element, therefore load versus displacement, but also considering some local phenomena as the third diagram showing the load versus the strain, both compressive and tensile strain that has been measured during the uh, experimental test. This kind of uh, analysis has been uh, adopted not only to validate the final formulation, but also to plan the additional full-scale load test. As an example, this uh, diagram show the comparison of the two final element formulation, again, in terms of load versus mids and displacement for the two uh, final element formulation associated with different loading, sorry, different shear span uh, ratio, starting from a shear span ratio equal to one associated to a three point bending test and different shear span ratio less than one in order to also um, uh, perform four point bending tests. And the results uh, show the um, uh, increasing deviation between the two final term formulation as soon as the loads move from the mid span section to the support uh, region passing from uh, flexural failure to uh, also shear failure. Uh, then as an uh, last example, this slide also show a comparison for additional full scale of test, in particular in this case for the translucent concrete beam, considering also the presence of top slab. Uh, for both the three-point bending test and the four-point bending test using uh, uh, modified compression field theory-based formulation to account also the interaction and the possible lack of connection between the beam uh, and the top slab. As mentioned, the uh, comparison has been done uh, not only considering the global effect of, the, uh, of this test, but also considering the local phenomena. Uh, as an example, this slide shows the uh, comparison between the crack pattern that has been evaluated through a digital model um, for the experimental crack pattern after the uh, full scale load test and the numerical ones achieved through again the finite element formulation. The good comparison also with the previous results allowed to validate those uh, finite element uh, formulation. So to conclude, uh, life cycle criteria and methods inter has been widely introduced in the last decade generally require nowadays a robust validation and an accurate calibration that are sometimes difficult tasks to be performed because of limited availability of data, particularly for existing pages. Um, in this uh, research uh, uh, presentation, the time varying performance of the concrete structure has been evaluated through a linear analysis based on finite element formulation, accounting the effect of corrosion and certainties. And this methodology has been validated based on experimental tests, both on corroded beams available in the literature and on uh, uh, outcome from the ingoing experimental campaign on a dismantled uh, pressure concrete bridge within the bridge PT uh, research project. And with this final slide, I want to thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Maria. We have time for one quick question. Question. Dr. Greenbaum, thank you for this interesting work. The corrosion modeling, numerical modeling, you, you assume a generalized corrosion as how, how are you considering the localized corrosion? This and your identity. Do you handle that with the uh, corrosion speed? Yeah, so I will start considering the uh, first experimental test that has been considered for the validation of the finite element model. For those tests, the um, uh, corrosion has been considered uh, as the um, uh, for right process that has been uh, conducted in those experimental tests. Yeah. Okay, uh, um, so as, as you mentioned, considering a uniform corrosion effect as reported in those uh, um, uh, in those studies. For the case of the Bridge 50 research project, uh, despite the fact that the, uh, the, the beams were uh, 15 years old uh, uh, beams, uh, after the um, full-scale load test, a visual inspection activity allows us to uh, evaluate the damage uh, 
uh, effect, particularly on steel, but mostly on the uh, prestressing strands, and uh, no significant effect of corrosion were uh, evident, at least in the region where we uh, uh, have the possibility to uh, have a look on the, on the strands, apart for some extreme extreme region, uh, generally due to um, uh, during the service life or not adding with water conveyance system that affect mostly the beams, uh, but also the PR caps that are uh, it will be uh, tested in the coming weeks. So the, the, the analysis that has been conducted and has been shown in this presentation um, are not considering the extent of corrosion for the British Peak Research Project. For the case of um, um, also, uh, as you mentioned, um, 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 not uniform uh, corrosion generally, um, as an example, referring also to some element that has been uh, adopted in the Bridge 50 research project, um, the diffusion process of chloride are uh, studied through the use of, um, uh, for instance, cellular automata approach, as in this slide, that are uh, adopted in order also to plan the additional uh, full scale load test that will, perform, will be performed on, this, uh, on these elements. Okay, thank you, Matia. We can thank you again. Welcome back. We can start with the second part of the seminar. We will have Mal 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 Malvina over. Sorry. <laughs> but it's um, 15 minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the, organ to the organizers of the seminar as well. I'm Malvina Ongar, I'm a postdoc student here at DICA, and I'm going to talk about the role of uncertainty in cost benefit analysis with an eye to um, improving seismic risk management. Now, first things first, this is actually a joint work with Daniele Kipfi and Lorenza Pepini, so thanks to them for the collaboration as well. Um, so, seismic risk management is, it includes a plurality of different measures, right? We have measures that we have to take before the disaster occurs like measures of prevention and preparedness, and then some measures that we take after the disaster, like measures of response and measures of recovery. But all these measures, seismic risk management in general, it has to face um, scarcity of resources. We have limited resources. We cannot just implement all measures, right? So choices between alternative measures are necessary. And the most successful tool to support decision-making under scarcity of resources is cost-benefit analysis, which aims to assess the economic efficiency of alternative, uh, of alternative options by weighing the costs and the benefits. And in doing that, it assesses which alternative is the most effective uh, given the resources available with respect to a certain objective, like the management of seismic risk. Now, the promises of cost-benefit analysis rely on um, it making decision-making transparent by translating expert judgment into numerical values that can be compared even by the lay people. And in doing that, then it makes the decision-maker accountable to the general audience. And in, in, in virtue of these features, cost-benefit analysis has enjoyed an increasing success in the last century, and it has been applied to a variety of different policymaking fields. But despite this success, CBA has been little applied, relatively little applied to seismic risk management. So this is why we wanted to look at cost-benefit analysis and try to understand both the limits and the potential of applying this tool to seismic risk management. And in our work, we do that by looking at some cases from recent Italian seismic history. Some of them deal with measures of preparedness. And uh, so the first one will deal with, uh, with a measure of preparedness, and the second one with a measure of prevention. So the first one refers to one of the most discussed cases in uh, recent Italian seismic history, which is the case of L'Aquila. Now, in the first months of 2009, the city saw an important increase in seismic activity, um, which meant that the uh, probability of a catastrophic event increased as well. But even with this increased probability, it was decided not to evacuate the population. But then the main shock hit and more than 300 people died. So now the natural question, and indeed one that has been debated 
for a long time is whether the city should have been evacuated given the increased probability of a catastrophic event. <laughs> and this study that came out shortly after the, the earthquake, they try to answer this question, precisely, precisely this question, by constructing a cost-benefit analysis of the measure of evacuation. Um, and they do that by estimating a probabilistic loss curve obtained by a time-dependent probabilistic hazard assessment that is updated every three hours or after every new shock, so that they can estimate the casualties at different stages of the disease form and compare these casualties with the cost of evacuation. And the result of the study is negative. So the authors claim that even given the increased probability of a catastrophic event, the cost of evacuation would still be higher than its benefit. Now, this is, of course, a very interesting approach and a very important result. But the confidence in this result has to take into account all the uncertainties that surround assessments of this, of this type. And this can be of, uh, of both epistemic and normative nature. So on the epistemic side, we have uncertainty concerning the evolution of both vulnerability and exposure in the different moments of the seismic storm. We have uncertainty concerning the behavior of the population, right? Both the population that had been ordered to evacuate, would they comply with that order? And the behavior of the population who didn't get the order, would they stay home or would they evacuate as well? And of course, we have uh, uncertainty concerning the correct values of the costs and benefits included in the analysis. On the normative side, we have uncertainty concerning the definition of an acceptable risk which is the threshold that the authors use to decide whether a policy is, is negative or, or positive, and uncertainty concerning what should be included as a benefit and what should be included as a cost in the analysis. Now, the, uh, the authors adopt an ex-ante perspective on this issue, because they ask whether a certain measure, evacuation, is worth taking at, at a certain uh, moment of time. And this is indeed the most common uh, type of application of cost-benefit analysis, because it has a direct link with decision-making. It tells the decision-maker what should be done or shouldn't be done, right? But given that it happens before the implementation of a certain intervention, it's also, as we've seen, fraught with many uncertainties. So, which means then that, you know, there's a higher risk of over-relying on the results of the analysis, on the determinant result of the analysis. Um, so what about an ex-post perspective? The purpose of an ex-post perspective is not to prescribe some course of action, but rather to describe the situation resulting from the implementation of a certain, of a certain intervention. Now, in order to assess, um, to make an ex-post assessment, we need not only to know what happened given the intervention, which is something, you know, the impact of which are now, we, we, that there is little uncertainty, uncertainty because we can observe those consequences, right? But we also need to know what would have happened without that intervention or with an alternative measure. And on that description, we, that there's still uh, high severe uncertainty. So the question then is, how do we know, how do we, how can we construct this counterfactual scenario, the scenario of what would have happened without the intervention. Now, an example of how to apply ex post analysis to seismic risk management is provided by another important case in recent Italian seismic history, which is the case of Norcia. Now, Norcia in 1979 was hit by uh, an important earthquake, after which it underwent a process of reconstruction uh, following the principle of building back better. So buildings were reconstructed and reinforced in the name of prevention. Okay. Now, from the ex post perspective, then the question is, were these measures successful? Were the costs of these, reinforce, uh, these reinforcement interventions uh, worth, uh, worth taking? Now, in 2016, Central Italy uh, was hit by another civil war. We had an earthquake of magnitude 6 hitting the, the nearby city of Amatrice. 
and the most significant earthquake of magnitude, of magnitude 66.8 hitting Norcia again. But these two shocks, they had very different impacts on the two cities. So on one hand, we have uh, the destruction of the historical core of Amatrice and almost 300 people dying. On the other hand, in Norcia, most of the houses were standing. And what is even more important, there were no casualties. So to some extent, we can take Amatrice to provide us with at least some tentative information about what would have happened in Norcia without those reinforcement, those reinforcement measures. But that's not all. We can also, and this is what this study has done, we can also try to correlate the costs of repairs and strengthening in 1979 with the observed empirical damage after 2016. And what the study concludes is that, quite unsurprisingly, the houses where a certain amount of money was spent in, um, in strengthening measures were also those where the least empirical damage was observed after the 2016 earthquake. So once again, we have some, um, we have some important information concerning what would have happened without those reinforcement measures. So yes, there is still severe uncertainty concerning what would have happened without a certain measure, because you can never observe what would have happened without a certain measure. But we believe that contextual information can still help reduce significantly this sort, this sort of uncertainty. But then one could say, listen, I see the value of an ex-ante analysis, right? Because it tells me what I should do. But why should I invest resources in conducting ex-post analysis? What's the value of them? And we believe that they are valuable for a variety of reasons. They inform future ex-ante analysis and therefore they inform future decisions. They provide an assessment of the state of the area and therefore they help planning for future, for future interventions on the area. And they help us identifying those risks related with a certain intervention that we could not foresee from the ex-ante perspective. But then we are now in, a, in the position to be able to expect from future uh, instances of those, of those measures. So to conclude, we think that a higher numbers of ex post analysis could be highly beneficial for the improvement of seismic risk management and to make cities, well, safer and more resilient. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think uh, maybe I need to do this uh, kind of input on the how to apply this assessment. But uh, one of the crucial parts is uh, then how to bring this this concept into practice. And when you look at this, uh, the key point is uh, uh, which is the information analysis that they can cause to make this risk assessment. Um, you have shown one slide where you were considering uncertainties as if it's technical normative. Uh, actually, uh, I will care about this classification because uh, we typically have uh, um, uncertainties that are aleatory, if they are going up to normally, or epistemic uh, because uh, information, like data, and so on. So, um, how can, can you envisage the incorporation of the two types of uncertainties? into practice using the risk assessment methodology. So, so which are the main aspects that we see uh, for the next uh, development of you know, the procedures really are viable with isolated units on our territory because they can be used to have uh, mm -hmm. uh, construction scale. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one possible way would be to hope that we can treat all these different uncertainties within a cost-benefit analysis, okay? So that we could uh, sort of treat them, uh, treat all of them. Um, which of course would make then, you know, cost-benefit analysis a good tool to support overall all things considered sort of judgments. 
Another possible route would be to look at which ones of these can actually be treated with instruments that can easily fit, can naturally fit within the cost-benefit analysis scenario, like you know, which ones could be, can be treated with probabilistic instruments or even expanding these instruments using imprecise probabilities. For instance, we could think of expanding cost-benefit analysis to incorporate with these uh, more sophisticated uh, sort of instruments, some of these uncertainties. I'm a bit more doubtful with respect to normative uncertainties, in the sense that normative uncertainties, there's no real um, scientific method, empirical, that, that's why they're, they're, they're distinct. There's no empirical method that can assess, uh, that can resolve them, right? So I think that in order to treat normative uncertainties, we might need instead to implement in the decision making process for sure, and perhaps even in cost benefit analysis, some participatory processes and the involvement of stakeholders, which are the only ones with the legitimacy to tell us where to go in the normative, to treat normative uncertainties. So I agree, perhaps uh, not all uh, aspects that you listed for normative uncertainty are not amenable for competitive modeling. So, for example, acceptable risk and uh, acceptable relativity targets are typically processed as uh, aleatory variables, uh, and uh, this should be covered. Uh, so, also, normative uncertainty should be um, aleatory in the descent. Yeah, there's just, I think, components in here as well. So there is a definition of what we say, you know, so the risk part is, of course, as you correctly say, like treatable in terms of aleatory or epistemic, uh, but the acceptable, so what we as a society decide that is the risk that we are willing to take, that is, that is more normative in nature. Thank you for inspiring presentation. Just a question regarding individual risk. I mean, cost-benefit analysis is very clear and rational and simple, but above all, by all means, there is no thing of individual risk that we need to research. Once we, we have a situation, it seems that the Milwaukee line mm -hmm. uh, was like this prior to the earthquake, of the probability of occurrence increase, means the risk for the persons was also increasing, was probably above what uh, we could call good risk. And uh, once it is above, then we have to take action, irrespective of the possibility of this is which Or how do you do that? Um. So, Individual risk. Uh, uh, okay, so first thing, so cost benefit analysis is not entirely economic in the sense that it's also used to include costs and benefits of non economic nature. Yes. Okay, so they're also supposed to include, you know, your own, um, like leaving, having to leave your home or perhaps increased psychological fear, you know, among the costs also. This wasn't done in this specific case, but it is like in the potential of cost benefit science applications for sure. And individual risk, um, so individual behavior in general tends to um, comply with intuitive cost benefit analysis calculations. That, that when we behave, we tend to, you know, we, we tend to at least want to behave in terms of, well, what does it take me to, for what does it take me to obtain the certain benefit, right? In terms of, well, what are the pros and what are the cons of what I'm doing? So, why policymakers will make uh, cost benefit analysis for society, right? Individuals will make less formal, of course, cost benefit analysis in terms of their own uh, of their own individual individual risks. Now, the uh, social cost benefit analysis, analysis should take into account also those individual cost benefit analysis, especially in terms of risk perception you know, and risk communication. So what I, policymaker or expert or scientist, tell the population about what the risks are, is going to influence their computations of their own individual risks and therefore their behavior as well. 
So if I want to obtain or avoid certain individual behaviors, then how I frame my, uh, my advice and how I frame my policies is relevant. I don't know if that goes in the direction of Okay. Thank you, Chiara, for introducing my presentation. Within uh, the topic of the seminar, my mm, presentation uh, is about integrated nature-based uh, solution for urban water management with a focus on design and management criteria and uh, their equipment with uh, measurement and monitoring system. The relationship between uh, water and cities is often complex we uh, must apply water to satisfy our needs. We have to treat wastewater, discharging it, and protecting receiving water bodies from pollution. And sometimes we have to defend from uh, flats uh, due to huge rainfall event. In the urban context, the relationship between integrated water service and uh, underground and surface hydrographic network is uh, strictly related. Our population is growing and is expected that by 2050, 63% uh, of world population will live in cities. It involves uh, an increase of the demand, built on water conveyance and wastewater treatment. Yeah. Urbanization implies all ceiling and uh, site consumption is growing and uh, without intervention, the growth rate will not stop. It involves an upset of the natural water balance. Precipitation can't be reintroduced in the natural water cycle due to soil sealing and reduced evapotranspiration due to the lack of green areas in cities. Precipitation sound to import potable and virtual water involve a large amount of poor quality runoff and wastewater. Climate change effects have a huge impact on cities in terms of an increase in the frequency and severity of floods and the water scarcity during the periods. In this context, nature-based solutions are strongly uh, suggested to make cities more resilient, sustainable, safe, and inclusive. Besides the urban water management, that is the topic of the presentation, they uh, provide multiple social and environmental benefits are easy to integrate in urban policy and planning and usually are cheap and cost effective. Moreover, they can meet several of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations Agenda 2030. With the reference uh, to uh, stormwater management, uh, they uh, promote water cycle restoration by filtration, evapotranspiration, and stormwater reuse. They uh, reduce uh, uh, raw volume reduce a delay peak flow and uh, provide combined soon overflow uh, control. Infiltration system uh, enhance the access recharge and improve the quality of infiltrated stormwaters. Stormwater reuse provide no drinking, water supply and preserve high quality sources. Nature-based solutions are not an alternative uh, but they should be integrated with the drainage system. While the traditional storage uh, tanks, uh, such as oversized pipe or detention tank, uh, provide hydraulic invariance, nature based solutions also meet the hydrologic invariance target. Here are some examples of infiltration system and evapotranspiration systems. To be effective, Nature-based solutions should be integrated in key points of the nature network and widespread in the urban context. Their management rules depend on the targets and different typology should be considered to meet different objectives. This is what we are doing in the National Research Project in Vision, for which I am the principal investigator. To maximize the benefits, 
nature based solution should be considered in combination. Here are some examples of integrated nature based solution I have considered in my studies. A green roof integrated with a rainwater tank for loss control and vegetation survival. Urban trees integrated with urban tank for flood reduction and root feeding. And a remote harvesting system integrated with infiltration system or a non drinking water supply as a model management. Nature based solution can meet multiple targets such as flood reduction, environmental protection, and draft income mitigation, but these objectives sometimes can be in contact with each other. For example, increasing retention time can uh, promote sedimental removal and non drinking water supply, but uh, the uh, prefilling of the storage volume uh, provided by uh, previous rainfall events can increase flood risk. So it's uh, very important to uh, focus the attention on the manager rule. To this aim, traditional design method and management rules uh, are often a sufficient. Uh, for example, the design store method is based on some simplified assumption and assume that the uh, outflow rate is constant. Moreover, to consider a single event, uh, can neglect the possibility of the prefilling of the storage capacity from previous rainfall event that is not negligible for a nature based solution characterized by low release rate by evapotranspiration and infiltration. On uh, the other hand, continuous simulation requires a long term series of input data and these involve high computational effort. Analytical probabilistic uh, approach. Uh, Developed in last decades, uh, which are referring to uh, some water retention basin and uh, recently uh, applied to nature based solution can be an alternative to traditional methods. Once uh, the analytical expression of the output variable has been defined, the method can derive its probability distribution function from the probability distribution function of the hydrological variables in input to the model. Uh, the approach relates the output variable to return period, and in my research studies, I have developed some equation to take into account the possibility of prefilling of the storage for more than one previous rainfall event. Here are some results of my studies published in international journals. Uh, the estimation of the probability distribution function of prefilling volume from previous events retention time for sedimentation, overflow volume for the retention basin, and volume for non-drinking uses. The analytical prolific approach uh, can be applied under different spatial and time scale and uh, uh, rainfall regimes with different management rules. An upgrade I'm working on is uh, integration with uh, a predictive model based on artificial intelligence to foresee both inflow and outflow for the best management of storm waters. The analytical probabilistic approach is suitable for multi objective application. In this study, I consider urban trees integrated with thermal pavements. Uh, at first, the analytical and probabilistic um, equation. Uh, aim to estimate the reduction in the overflow probability provided by the filtration to the primary pavement and interception and evapotranspiration by three. Then I have also uh, developed some uh, provisional equation to also take into account the benefits in terms of root feeding provided by the primary pavement. Here are some results. With reference to runoff control, the probability overflow is strongly reduced by increasing the storage capacity, particularly increasing the thickness of the gravel aggregate of the floor payments. And uh, this reduction is uh, more significant when also uh, infiltra uh, infiltration, evapotranspiration, and intersection by three is uh, uh, high. Considering uh, both runoff control and roof feeding, uh, must include that uh, the uh, water content uh, 
uh, at the beginning of the rainfall event must be greater than a minimum capacity corresponding to the uh, within point for each feeding and the water content at the end of a uh, rainfall event must be uh, less than the maximum storage capacity to avoid flood. Here, another application of the analytical privacy approach with reference to a remote reliability system integrated with an infiltration system. In this case, I have developed an analytical and privacy equation to consider the probability of stormwater use for non drinking water supply, the probability of overflow in the filtration system to consider a water barrel restoration, and the probability of overflow in the drainage network to avoid spillage. This theoretical scheme will be tested in the research project drops within the framework of the Polysocial Award 2023. At the day of campus of Politecnico di Milano at Cascina Nozero, we will store an water tank integrated with an infiltration system. And the aim is to define the best management rules for some water management, both during dry and wet weather conditions. To balance the different uh, targets, uh, the system will be integrated with a measurement and monitoring system. In particular, in uh, the living lab of the DROPS project, we will install a, a weather station to um, collect data, rainfall data that then will be used in uh, the model, a uh, diver meter to uh, monitor the uh, remote uh, the level of uh, water in the uh, remote tank, some flow meters on the outlets to uh, measure the outflow for irrigation and non-drinking uh, water supply, a hydrometer to monitor uh, the uh, groundwater level and uh, the effects of the infiltration system on the aquifer, and some humidity sensor to uh, measure the uh, water content under the infiltration system in the irrigation area and in a portion of soil not interested by the infiltration system. All instruments and sensors will be connected to a platform to collect data that then will be used for the analysis and the validation of the model. Here, another uh, um, topic I am working on related to nature-based solution and uh, uh, urban water management. And this is the investigation of the impact of infiltration system on illicit water in sewer system. That is a huge problem for uh, the uh, sewer systems. In uh, uh, my studies, I have developed a conceptual model to estimate the performance of different configurations of flows and temperature sensors in terms of measurement uncertainty to find the best configuration all, also in terms of uh, cost benefits. The uh, scheme was uh, successfully tested within the framework of uh, the research program for water uh, to a case study in Milano areas. In uh, this case, uh, the uh, drainage network was affected by illicit uh, groundwater inflow uh, in summer due to the activation of uh, uh, irrigation channel. I think that uh, also this is uh, a significant example of our innovation and industrialization uh, can support urban water management to make cities more safe, resilient, and sustainable for future challenges. Thank you for your attention. At first, I define the analytical expression of the value of 
So uh, relating is to the input, the rainfall data typically, and then the characteristic of the system um, developing. Then uh, starting from the product distribution function of uh, the rainfall input as a typical exponential distribution function, we can derive the predistribution function of the uh, output, the variable of interest. The, uh, the model is validated by continuous simulation, starting from the analytical expression defining the parameter. Is Alessandro Ceppi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alessandro Ceppi, and the talk I'm going to introduce today is Flood Forecast Tool for Early Warning System in Millennium Banana. First of all, I'd like to thank all my research group and also the public body, the municipality of Bobito Machago, and the civil protection of the Lombardy region we are working with. Okay. Well, yeah. So uh, we are in an area that, of course, most of you know since we live and work in, in, in an urban area. Um, we know the problem affecting the Milan city. Okay, we have three main rivers, the Lona, Seves, and Lambro, and crosses Milan. And of course, during the history, uh, what we see, they just change the color of the picture. But we have the same problem in the 70s, and we have the same problem today. Uh, this one small picture is just taken on the 1st of November in the last flood event that hit the city. And in fact, in the last 15 years, these are the major floods, uh, the recent flood in the last five years. So we, if we count all the money for damages, we have more than 200 million euros for damages. Okay, and this was a particular flood in 2014 uh, just triggered me to research on this study because uh, uh, we had two severe floods, one in July and one in November, as were very uh, terrific events during this period. Um, and these are the recent floods. And the last one that I'm going to show you uh, an case example uh, what, what we see with our technique of early warning system. Uh, of course, the, the problem affecting Milan, uh, everyone knows. Uh, we have buried our sea, our early rivers. And uh, of course, there is an increasing of the urban area, so uh, a change of land use and landscape. And we study also that we have a reduction of threatened food. Okay. So we are waiting, of course, for detention basin as hydraulic structure uh, to protect our city, to make our city uh, safe. But meanwhile, uh, what we can do? Of course, we can uh, develop uh, no structural matching like early warning system. And exactly what we did uh, together with the uh, civil protection authorities and the municipality of Bobisi Mashaga. And this morning, we have a wonderful talk by Professor Ruvilla. Uh, we have seen that monitoring system is the first step. And then what you can do is forecast, okay, to anticipate what can be in the future. And so let's say that our system is uh, a sort of last mine. Okay, so we work in synergy with uh, the uh, public authorities, uh, local bodies, uh, municipalities, municipalities, and so uh, we develop these two systems. The mockup that is an Italian acronym stands for uh, monitoring system uh, of other floods, and so that stands for Seveso, Olona, and Lambert. Okay, so first of all, I just show you the mock-up monitor system. So this is our dashboard that we set up. We uh, install uh, two piezometers uh, sensor, uh, one weather station, one uh, uh, radar sensor to measure the water level, and all the data are uh, acquired through the data logger. Also, we measure uh, the uh, surface temperature for road tide risk. Uh, asked by the civil protection. And so we can see in real time, so every five minutes, all the data. This is very important uh, monitoring uh, 
the this is the um, the Seveso River basin uh, crossing the city of Bobbio Mashal. And uh, just to zoom in on uh, on this area, you here we have short track that's about two hundred meters. Uh, we have installed two piezometers to have a redundancy of the measure. This is very important. And also, in, in we can use the slow parameters already uh, starting on these researches, so we can calculate the flow rate. So uh, we have in real time water level under this chart. And so we can give some alert, some warning to the civil protection. And the second is the forecast system, uh, warning system using meteorological and hydrological model. And uh, I'm pretty uh, fond of the multi model approach. So we don't use only one model, but use different models. They use different initial condition, boundary condition, and also different uh, physical scheme uh, studying atmospheric process. And this is our dashboard. So at the glance, you can see when you enter uh, the uh, current situation. And here you can select the monitor river section, uh, see the available uh, meteorological models, and see the forecasted discharge and forecasted rainfall. And this is pretty accessible line to everyone, to all the cities. So they can uh, view the situation for the next day ahead. Of course, uh, to set up this um, dashboard and the system, we use different observed value coming from the official regional network and also from the citizen side network, uh, this name and the network and co founder is 21 years that it exists. And these are all the meteorological models that I just told you. So they have different grid style resolution, different lead times. They are deterministic but also probabilistic models. So they use the ensemble techniques. And this is very important to set up a multi model. And of course, we have our hydrological model, so thanks to my colleagues that uh, I developed during uh, the last decades. Uh, so it's a fully uh, distributed model, rainfall and off transformation. And uh, so we put the output of meteorological model into the input of our hydrological model to predict the flow rate and discharge. And I'll show you some uh, results uh, for the Bovisio Banchago Gloge section. So we use the contingency table. You can see here the blue crosses, the performance of our hydrological model. Of course, the best is 1 1. So we try to minimize uh, the false alarm and the miss alarm. Okay. And here you have the performance of all the models in the last four years after setup our hydrological model for tuning. Okay, and you can see use the multimodal approach, you can better evaluate the error of meteorological fault. We are in an area that you, mainly in summertime we are hit by thunderstorm. And thunderstorm, uh, these convective them are let's say very difficult to predict. Okay, and in fact, also we did an analysis comparing the stratical event in green line here and convecting them in the orange line. You can see how difficult to predict the convective end in this area. And that's why we also add many floods during summertime. Okay. And also we we came up with a research how we can tackle, how we can face the problem of convective bands. And so we we studied and published this approach that is called the shift target approach. So we get the meteorological model and we shift in different direction the precipitation because we know that for instance if it is predicted 30 40 kilometers west or north or south of course we know the unpredictable uh, scenario of the model so what can happen for instance this is a case of the flood of 2014 so the model predict a west for um, shift of the forecast okay and if we put this let's say peak of precipitation just over our basin and see what happens okay and that's what we call the shift target approach this is just to report the union jet in 1915 okay so with different uh possibilities 
Okay. And lastly, uh, we are involved with PhD cases with the civil protection uh, authority. Of course, I, from the hydrological study, we know the rainfall treasure. Okay, so we know that we handle these two. We are in regional no warning, so we just go back to see uh, which well the precipitation that produced a higher discharge. Okay, and uh, it seems strange, but the local authorities, they have the precipitation threshold, but they did not take into account the antigen moisture conditions that we study in hydrology book. Okay, it seems really strange. Okay, so there is a missing passage, but we want to go further and we do not use the classical, let's say, this great approach with the antigen moisture conditions. So uh, with different classes, one, two, three, because we know that a small amount of precipitation can dramatically change my threshold. And so we want a continuous approach. And so we develop together this equivalent rain that taking account of the five days uh, rainfall events, the good number, and so we are able to produce this base equivalent rain. Okay, this is represents the worst of the hydraulic potential risk due to the past uh, rains. Okay, and so we can also add the term of forecasting rain. And this is for the orange threshold. This is the second one for the Kelvin Authority. Okay, so for every dodging section of the uh, our area, Seveso, Olona, and Rio. And of course, uh, Lam and Lam, sorry. <laughs> and of course, these are the results. And you can see the improvement using the equivalent of rainfall uh, in comparison with a classical approach, okay, using the F2 score that give more weight to the missed alarm. Because of course, what we want to reduce are the missed alarm, okay? That's are very complicated. Okay, lastly, and I'm going to finish, okay, and just to show you the last flood case, it was 31st of October, okay, just one month ago. Okay, so we had our forecast, okay, we were in front of, uh, technically speaking, it was a mesoscale convective system, we were uh, a score line, typically in the summer, but we were in Atoms due to the climate change. And this is the rather observation or engage emerging between radar picture and observation. Okay, I'm honestly, we were not a missed alarm, so no models predict a red alarm. Okay, but the monitor system was able to fall in real time, but the day before, we were able to tell and advise the local authority and say, well, be aware that we are yellow threshold tendency to orange. So, okay, and if I were ready to start on the first hour of the morning to be on the bridges and follow the river situation, okay? And this was the, the, the monitor system working in real time. So, some conclusion, of course, monitoring first and forecasting in real time are fundamental tools in living in extremely safe, rest and sustainable season, of course, okay? We are in front of an hazard. We cannot reduce the hazard, okay? So we do not want to keep the water away from the people, but we can keep the people away from the water. So we can reduce the exposure and the vulnerability in sufficient time with these two early warning systems. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> in one of your slides where you about discharge of the solder, with a link to the presentation of the first part of it. Yeah, was one small bridge with very low zero. So the question is how the discharge results were established? Uh, yeah, and in the middle, are you talking? Ah, uh, uh, here, all right. So, so the question is, where? Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So, this, this, we, we are in the municipality of Bolivia, province of Machado, and so we, uh, we study in detail uh, the river section, okay, and so with an hydraulic model, also we were able to. Calculate uh, 
the, the free threshold, so the yellow, orange, and red, for this cross channel section of uh, the river series. So, crossing the city again. So, the infrastructure facilities uh, that probably the plants were lost for the children. Uh, well, I mean, no, not, 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 not out of the bed. Okay, so just, just the, the river section. Okay, so not, not, not the flooded area. Okay, not the flooded area. In this case, it's the, the threshold are inside, of course. So thank you, Alexander. We can move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Nicolas Galli, and present us the impact of agriculture, urban agriculture and the potential in mega cities. Nicolas, you have 10 minutes. That is it. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm bringing you back to the context of uh, nature based solutions, in particular urban agriculture, but with a rather unusual, probably, perspective that is the perspective of food security. So, um, some global trends that you probably already know of the global population is increasing, and the share of it that is living in urban areas is increasing as well. And on the other hand, we have a, a trend of increasing unsustainability of the global food production and supply system using around 40% of the global land, uh, um, one third emitting, accounting for almost one third of global emissions and using almost three quarters of the global freshwater resources. And if you put those two um, trends together, uh, you see that the, also, especially the long supply chains that characterize the um, food supply system, uh, make it very vulnerable to, to, to climate shocks, disruptions, and price fluctuations. And this leads in urban contexts, especially in urban contexts where you have marginalized social groups, to situations where these social groups tend to rely on um, less expensive food, cheap food that is typically ultra processed and so uh, unhealthy with um, consequences in terms of um, health risk uh, in, in cities. And urban agriculture is interestingly gaining um, traction as a uh, potential uh, solution to part of this problem as it is a nature-based solution that takes resources, uh, human and material resources, from makes use of these resources from the city and returns products, services, and uh, material and immaterial goods back to the same urban context. And it has been historically used, um, populations have resorted to urban agriculture in times of crisis, but the recent um, interest comes from links with uh, sustainability pillars, or three of them, so social benefits, economic benefits, and environmental benefits that change depending on the type of urban context that we're looking at. So uh, we typically think of urban agriculture as a nature-based solution that as urban greening in general mitigates the heat island effect, can help in storm uh, water runoff reduction and increases local biodiversity, um, also providing habitat for pollinators and so on. And also with a whole range of social impacts like social inclusion, um, education, recreational purposes, and so on. But this is very typical for developed context. Uh, an added benefit that uh, developing contexts are really interested in, in is uh, food security, intended rather as nutrition security. So providing safe and healthy food grown locally to marginalized parts of the urban population. So, of course, it cannot be a solution alone to improving food security in urban context that would be uh, unfeasible and possible, but it can help have a marginal effect in helping rebalancing unbalanced diets uh, of uh, fragile strata of urban populations. And so our idea was to see how far we can take this from pilot projects to a city scale uh, thinking in, uh, in this way. So more operationally, we wanted to try and see uh, what was the optimal configuration of urban gardens in a very big city, trying to close these dietary gaps for the uh, maximum population possible without um, being too heavy on resource use. So we needed a case study that uh, to, to serve as a pilot that was representative of this increasing urbanization trend, uh, had vulnerable groups relying on unhealthy food for their diets. Um, and we found it in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is the biggest city in, uh, in 
Brazil, it has 12 million inhabitants. Um, there is uh, problems of low adherence to, to, to balanced and healthy diets. And we have also very important, some uh, previous experience, well known of projects and initiatives that are uh, aimed at supporting the urban agriculture seen as a nutrition security solution. So what we do is we look for the optimal configuration, selecting areas that are available within the urban fabric to be transformed into urban gardens and selecting the right crops to, to, to be grown on them based on the dietary requirements, the agroclimatic suitability, the cultural suitability, and their use of resources, in particular land and water. So concerning the selection of areas, what we do is we look at city plans, of course, and we look for uh, areas that are available and we grade them based on our range of suitability criteria, which are weighted by eliciting local experts. So people from Sao Paulo experts in um, either nutrition or urban planning that can tell us which criteria are most important. And this is a typical example of a urban unused uh, green area that uh, makes up our pool of possible conversion areas. So once we know where we want to put our urban gardens, we have to decide what to grow on them. And we start from an analysis of the diet. So we take the local diet in Sao Paulo from um, family budget surveys that have been done in the last years. And we compare it with our reference diet that is the one published by The Lancet, that is a balanced, healthy diet that is also aimed at uh, sustainability in, uh, in resource use. And what we see is this comparison has to be done by uh, food groups. And so we see that we have a strong deficit in starchy vegetables, so tubers, pumpkins, potatoes, and so on, vegetables in general, and fruits. And so these are the three categories that we focus on. And within these three categories, we have to find crops that are suitable for the local climate, which is a subtropical uh, humid climate with dry winters, so crops that grow there, and possibly products already present in the local diet. So that social acceptability is more likely. People know how to use this food, know how to cook it, and they possibly like it. And that's also very important. And so then for each of these crops, for each of the areas that we find, we look at how much water we would need to support this agriculture. And we do it via um, an agroecological model, what means that has been developed here at Politecnico di Milano. Um, it basically performs uh, the vertical water balance of the root zone of these crops and uh, partitions the total requirement that you get into a clean water requirement that is the part that can be um, supplied by locally naturally occurring precipitation and a so-called blue water requirement that is uh, the part that you would have to supply by artificially watering the garden. So if we look at the scarcity of green water, meaning how much I should provide with irrigation with respect to how much I need, we see that in, uh, in summer months when rainfall uh, occurs, so we are in the southern hemisphere, summer, December to April, uh, these are cross crop box plots, meaning that uh, water scarcity is very low, but also the variability is very low. So the response of all crops is more or less the same. The problem is when you have scarcity, you also have an increase in uh, variability. So different crops respond very much differently uh, if the situation climatically is a very open scarce situation. So this makes this criterion a very important selection criterion because in difficult times, that's when it becomes detrimental for crop selection. So we put this in our system configuration design. What we basically do is we take the areas and decide how much of each area we want to cultivate with each crop. And from that, we know how much we are producing and looking at the diet where we can understand with a limiting factor approach, how many, for how many people we are virtually rebalancing the diet. On the other hand, we know how much water we are consuming. And so we have an information of how much water we would need to support the system. So we test this sort of optimization uh, with different runs, gradually increase the number of people for which we want to feed the gap. So it works. I set a minimum number of people for which I want to fill the gap. And uh, I find the configuration that uses the least possible irrigation water. We do a step that seems huge, 125,000 people, but you have to think about Sao Paulo. So it's 1% of the population. So we do 1% by 1%. We increase the size of the system and we look at how it evolves. 
And it evolves like this. So on the um, x-axis, you have the water that we are using. On the y-axis, the right one, which refers to the black curve, you have the number of people for which you are compensating the diet. And on the uh, left y-axis, you have the area that we are using uh, divided into different colors according to different crops. So the reddish one are fruits, the yellowish one are starchy crops, and the greenish one are vegetables. And what is interesting to see is this sort of evolutive behavior of the selection of the crops, where you, especially in the vegetables, you see that you have first prevalence of a given crop that then gets gradually substituted by the next one, and so on and so forth. This is because if you keep the system at a low size, uh, you are allowed to use crops that are very um, water use efficient, so they can uh, produce a lot with not produce a lot, but they use uh, very little water. But at some point, you have to abandon that crop to use one that is less water efficient, but more productive, because the people that you're trying to feed become a lot, and the areas at some point that you can use also get the saturation. So if you push the system towards very high scales, the efficiency decreases. And this we also see in the relation between the number of people for which we are closing the gap and the volume of water that we are using that is more than linear. So your efficiency in using water for this process decreases as the size of the uh, system, the global city scale system increases. This was uh, with constraints both on the crops. So we excluded crops that go into water scarcity during winter time and uh, areas with medium suitability. We only kept the best ones. If you uh, remove those constraints, you see that you get to a sort of saturation point of efficiency. Mm, but I mean, you can go further, but at some point you reach this peak in the relation between people that you can feed and water that you're using, where the system abruptly, in some sense, becomes way less efficient in, uh, in water use. And this you can see also here. And this is also um, with less constraints, again, so in the, no constraints on the crops and on the area, so pushing towards productivity only. So if you want to compare the three, these three configurations with each other, we see that the first one that I showed you, the more uh, restrictive one, reaches some sort of production frontier at some point here where you have the light green column. The other ones can go further, but at huge costs in terms of water use. On the y-axis here, we have the cubic meters of water that you need to fill the dietary gap for one person. So you have to think about where it is worth to stop in terms of costs and benefits. In general, if we look at the biggest shares that we can reach in terms of global population, the most conservative one stops working at a maximum of 13.6% of the population for which you can compensate the diet, which is quite a high number, actually. So we could stop before while being more sustainable, probably. And um, But what is important to say is that water, even if we are in a subtropic humid climate, so it rains a lot, it's, I think, uh, 1,400 millimeters per year of precipitation, so uh, it's a lot. Water availability and uh, your efficiency in water use remains a crucial criterion while designing this sort of nature-based solutions. And this leads us to a, a whole range of uncertainties that uh, we still have to address. We're starting to study this, so um, looking at the impact of climate change, how we can use um, also polluted water, which could be really interesting, especially in terms of organic waste that can serve as fertilizer and all the context in, in uh, economy, society, and environment, so not only um, biodiversity and the typical ecosystem services that we know for nature-based solutions, but also what would be really interesting to see is the actual impact on uh, uh, malnutrition reduction and the associated reduced uh, sanitary costs that you have from better preventing non-communicable diseases that are associated with bad diets and maybe comparing them with the expenses that you have in maintaining such a system um, under a uh, what could be some sort of cost-benefit analysis approach. So before finishing, I just want to give some credits. This started as a master thesis work by Ayanna, who is now doing the PhD with us. The thesis was uh, co-supervised by Prof. Prof. Mario Cristina Rulli and myself. 
with the precious, precious collaboration of Prof. Marcioni from the Nutrition Department of the University of Sao Paulo. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. My mind is actually a little more than a question. So, who is typically sustaining the cost of this kind of? Uh, yeah, the, the final, yes. Who did, for example, pay for the water or the benefit is a collective benefit? So, because it's not an intensive. Mm -hmm. So, in Italy, we have the piece. So, who is usually the person that uh, sustains it? Yeah, so the, the projects that are already there in Sao Paulo are typically supported, so public, uh, publicly supported projects. So, for instance, from the municipality, together with NGOs that uh, uh, are able to get fundings for these sort of things, because typically it's not um, advantages from the strictly economic point of view, because um, if you just look at money, it's more costs than benefits. What you have to include are uh, shadow benefits due to social improvements. And so these kind of things are the type of things that are typically supported with uh, some degree of public funding. Then at this scale, you could think at some sort of commercial applications. That depends actually a lot. We have seen on the, on the size of the single uh, plot itself. You could think of different management systems that adapt. So if you have, uh, I don't know, 100 square meter plot, relatively small one. You can manage it with some sort of cooperation, neighborhood level cooperation. But then you have in the among the areas that we look at, there are also some very big ones. And in that case, you would require some probably some higher level of management. And then you could think about something more profit intended and um, commercial. In that case, yes. Yeah, my idea was just to develop it's not a cost benefit, but if you want to multiply and analysis. Yes. Yeah, we also include in the in the criteria there was also something related to marketability, so closeness to places where people buy and sell this sort of thing. So you could think of like integrating that also the, the, the commercial supply chain in, in the system. That would also be interesting. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Nicolas, again. Then we can move to the very last speaker, who is Beatrice Cantoni, and uh, she's going to say, talk us about risk based approaches for safe and sustainable drinking water production and distribution chain. Let me just open. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Morning, everyone. I'm Beatrice Cantoni, a researcher in the environmental uh, section of our department. I think I want to thank the organizer for uh, this uh, seminar because I think today we saw a lot of different applications uh, where our department is with the safety and sustainability. And I want to give you another idea related to drinking water supply. Uh, so in a urban context, uh, drinking water supply starts with the water sources uh, that are abstracted, treated, distributed, and then they come to our taps. And uh, providing clean water is one of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals that is really highly linked to other uh, sustainable development goals, such as guaranteeing good human health, uh, mm, develop sustainable cities, and uh, improve the responsible consumption and production patterns. I think this last is very crucial because we all have to understand that how we consume drinking water is actually uh, influencing a lot on the sustainability of its supply. Why I say this? Because the alternative to tap water, as you know, is bottled water. And uh, in the literature in the last decades, uh, there is a high consensus on the fact that Actually, the environmental impacts of bottled water are much higher compared to tap water, mainly due to uh, waste generation, uh, energy consumption, and uh, global warming potential. So, um, is this enough for us? Because we, I think, we are almost all more and more aware of the impacts of plastic bottled water on the environment. 
uh, is this enough for us to change our habits? Unfortunately, it seems no. Italy is the second uh, uh, country in the world, right just after Mexico and right before Thailand for bottled water consumption. So it seems that the sustainability issue is not a driver for us to change our behaviors. <laughs> no, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> change our behavior and uh, so maybe we have to look at other aspects such as uh, safety so in fact for the current and future challenges to have a sustainable and safe uh, drinking water supply are not only related to sustainable consumption but also on water pollution uh, and climate change and today for the research the main uh, topics related to water pollution are uh, related to new contaminants for contaminants of emerging concern. I think maybe you saw some labels now in the products that you use every day, like BPA, bisphenol A, free PFAS. We had a Greenpeace uh, report on how much PFAS we have in uh, our waters in uh, Lombardy. It has a high hype uh, in the uh, news. Environment, pharmaceutical. Because these are just some examples of uh, contaminants of emerging concern that are chemicals that are used in our everyday life products. And so both when they are produced and when we consume them, they can be released in the environment. They can enter the water cycle and come back to us through drinking water and food. So we have to understand how to handle this. And uh, mainly we have two goals. One is to assess what's the current risk due to these uh, chemicals. And the second one is to understand how to intervene. And so what are the, uh, pre um, the interventions to be prioritized? Uh, how do we do it? We combine different approaches. And uh, as Professor was uh, already explaining, we are doing monitoring, uh, risk assessment, experiment, and uh, modeling. And I want to start with the uh, risk assessment. So. In the risk assessment, we want to assess the exposure concentration of these contaminants and what's their health effect so that we can then evaluate the risk. And this is done in the traditional uh, chemical risk assessment, looking at with a deterministic approach. So we have only point values for the concentration of exposure and the drinking water target level that is the acceptable concentration. Uh, in, uh, in case of a lifetime uh, consumption of that uh, water. And the ratio of the two is called benchmark quotient, that is an indicator of the risk. If this is higher than one, we have a, a risk. If this is lower than one, we don't have risk. It seems easy, but in the case of emerging contaminants, since they are new, we don't know a lot uh, about them. So there are a lot of uncertainties related to both the exposure and uh, the other. And so what we did in collaboration with the KWR Water Research Center and the, the Dutch National Institute for Public Health and Environment is to, pro to include all these uncertainties in the risk assessment. So we are able actually to uh, build a distribution uh, of the probability of this risk. And so we are able to understand what's the probability of exceeding a risk of one or for example, we could be interested also in see what's the probability of exceeding by 10% the target level. And when we develop this procedure, then we applied it. Uh, I show you just an example uh, of comparison of tap water and bottled water. And we compare the risk due to alkyl phenols and uh, phthalates that are two classes of emerging contaminants that are plasticizers. Uh, and we collected data from uh, the literature due, uh, related to the concentration of tap and bottled water worldwide, and also very interesting, uh, the water consumption habits of different countries. Here is just an overview of the distribution of concentration of four phthalates in bottled water and uh, tap water. And we converted these concentrations into the overall risk due to their mixture. And in this graph, I will walk you through it. 
uh, we see uh, different bubbles. The diameter of the bubbles are proportional to the prob probability of exceeding the risk of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and 1. Uh, and on the x-axis, you see the consumption of bottled water, uh, like liters per inhabitant per day. And on the y-axis is the total water consumption, so the sum of bottled water and tap water. Usually in risk assessment, we use two liters per day as a, a water consumption. And here you can see two different scenarios. One is uh, where the total water consumption is given by bottled water. So two liters of bottled water. And this case is that it, we don't have any bottled water consumption, but the two liters are given only by tap water. So you see that the two given by the concentration, the two risks at which we are exposed are very different if we compare bottled water and tap water. Then what I think is really interesting is we uh, collected data of actual water consumption of different countries. And we had 25 countries and we clustered them in three. And so for here it's just some examples, but just to give you an idea, uh, countries in uh, cluster two, where Italy is, have a higher exposure, so bigger diameter of the bubble compared to countries in cluster one, even if we drink much less water compared to them. But this is just because we are uh, mainly drinking bottled water. So the source of water we are choosing is highly uh, influencing the, the exposure uh, uh, at which we are, uh, the levels at which we are exposed uh, to these contaminants. So now that there is lunch, you are <laughs> free to choose. Uh, but let's talk mainly on the, on the tap water. Let's uh, um, give away the bottled waters and let's see if we have to intervene, how can we prioritize some interventions in the water supply? And I give you just two quick examples. One is related to the treatment of PFAS in uh, um, in uh, the full state treatment plant given by the uh, granular activated carbon process. This uh, uh, process is a very common process that we have uh, in the drinking water treatment plants where the activated carbon is like a porous material that is able to absorb uh, contaminants, but uh, over time it loses, it's saturated, let's say. And so at the outlet of the filters, the concentration of contaminants start to increase over time. So we have to understand when we have to stop the process because the, uh, the risk is not acceptable anymore. And then we regenerate the carbon, which becomes new and can be uh, reused again. Um, we tried to uh, evaluate these saturation pores for 12 PFAS in drinking water using four different activated carbons. We did it in the lab and then we validated it with the full scale monitoring data. Uh, the lab scale test, uh, I performed them in uh, uh, the German uh, Environmental Protection Agency and uh, in collaboration with TU Berlin. And uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, starting from the full scale filters that have a volume of 15 to 20 cubic meters. We use some downscaling methods to build the very small columns. You can see that small like pants that we have actually also here in the lab um, that are able to simulate the saturation curve that I showed you in almost one week. What that in reality in full scale is happening in one year. So you can see that we can test much more uh, water qualities and operating conditions in the lab. And this is what we actually perform. Then knowing the, satura the saturation curve for each compound, here it's just uh, some example, the dots are the experimental uh, uh, results. We then model, fit the models of the curves, and then we understand what are the main parameters related to the compound, the activated carbon and the water quality that are affecting the saturation curve behavior. And then we are able to simulate other conditions that we couldn't test. And this is useful to select the best activated carbon or for example, to evaluate the configuration of the filters. Finally, 
another example is due to the fact that the trust, lack of trust in uh, consumers is mainly also due to uh, the distribution network, not in, in the treatment step. And so we evaluated that the release of bisphenol A, BPA, from uh, some pipelines that are used uh, in the distribution network. In particular, nowadays it's more and more common to use uh, uh, the technique of relining uh, with the epoxy resins that are inserted in old pipelines, uh, not to substitute the old pipelines in the industry. But these epoxy resins have BPA in uh, the formulation among the various ingredients. Then BPA with other ingredients are polymerized in C2. But if the polymerization is not 100% completed, then we could have some BPA that is released over time. And this could be uh, an hazard for, for uh, human health. So we tested in, in the lab different uh, epoxy resins with different uh, water qualities. This is uh, thanks to the design of experiments. We designed the, the experiments in order to reduce the number of experiments but maximizing the results. Uh, and we tested different uh, uh, disinfection uh, concentration in water and different aggressivity index of the water itself in contact with the epoxy resins. And in different conditions, we saw the release of BPA over time. These are in the dots are experiments and then we fit the model. And with this kinetic model, we then, let's see if it works. Yes, we applied it to an hydraulic model to evaluate where in a real case, where actually two epoxy resins are already installed, whether the risk would be exceeded or not. So green, we are okay. Yellow, no. Uh, red, not at all. So just to give you an idea. And in this moment, uh, we are okay. And, but we can see what are the most vulnerable areas of the of the network, and more important, we can also simulate in the future if we want to have some relinings, what could be the the effect and the final risk. So these are were just some uh, uh, examples. I want to just say the next uh, challenges uh, in the project return that is. Uh, funding my research uh, um, position at this moment. I want to see how we can convert the saturation curve for concentration of each contaminant in an overall risk, weighting their toxicity, the concentration, so we can see, okay, but the mixture when becomes uh, uh, um, not acceptable anymore. And uh, finally, with uh, an individual grant uh, that was funded uh, by AXA, I want to see uh, the influence of climate change on how we will be more exposed to these contaminants, both from drinking water and food. I want to thank in particular the Safe Water Lab, so the group uh, here at Politecnico by Manuel Antonelli and all the researchers that helped me uh, to do all the studies I showed you. And thank you. <laughs> Not on bottle wood. No. <laughs> no, joking. Yeah, it's, it's really the, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you're right. It really depends on the contaminants you are looking for. For example, the other, the alkyl phenols, for example, BPA, uh, show that the concentration are quite similar. So in the clusters that are drinking more, no matter the source, they are more exposed because the two sources are quite similar in terms of concentration. So it really depends on the contaminants we are searching. I was looking for uh, alkyl phenols and uh, 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 phthalates that are plasticizers, so probably we will not find them in glass water. So, but the, all the sustainability part is still also for glass water, bottle water, I think, should be a concern. So they take home messages. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, from point of view, it's also, I didn't talk about it, but it's also an economic sustainable point of view. With the one liter of uh, tap water, we can have uh, 500 liter of tap water.